Leave like it like this. Okay. So we'll, got it. We can now we're gonna have the um, pre meeting. Our first one in Ooh. our new headquarters. It's exciting. Welcome to everybody that came. Uh, agenda review. Anybody have anything that wants to be pulled or added or subtracted or questions? Are we going to do well the water explorer in the post meeting? Yes. Correct. In here. And the same way it'll be live. So may uh, and that'll be after the WIDA. We have regular meeting, WIDA, and then uh let's see. Uh are we doing like just agenda items or are we doing what we've earned in the last week? Um, I will right now is agenda, okay. then we'll get to city manager's report and then city council report out. It's great. Anything for agenda? Going, going. Go on. City manager, anything good for the order? I have a few comments, um, if I could, because we're not going to do them again in there, right? This yeah, is... we do them again out there. Oh, then I'll just wait. I'll okay. just wait for that form. This form will be more hands on. Okay. Thank you. City Council? I sent an email to Council earlier today regarding the RMMA. Uh, they are looking at adding funds to the budget to cover two consultants. One is for uh, a facilitator for the group, and the other one is to uh, facilitate a outreach slash study on uh, ways to mitigate the impacts of noise for the area. Um, surrounding areas um, and then also on their agenda today was to include uh, an approval of the city of Lafayette to this group and um, it was approved that Lafayette would join so now there's eight members of the group um, so that includes like Boulder, Superior, Lafayette, I believe Erie, we just talked about Erie, uh, Westminster, Arvada, um, Broomfield County and then Jefferson County commissioners um, are all part of the group. So, uh, and then I also sent an alternate email that lists the detail on the consultants for that. So I committed us to getting back with that group by March 1st. Um, and this is what they explained is a one-time fee for this year of $11,410. Um, right now it's $3,600 to be a part of this group and for facilitation. Um, next year, I'm assuming dues might go up, but it may not be at 11,000. So we just need to do more from our group. Um, it's not to be unanimous, but a majority, obviously, to move that approval of that funding forward for all of them. So is there anybody that does not want that to go on to an agenda item for voting? I have a question. Yes. Do we have, I mean, obviously it's not a ton of money, but where would that come out of in the budget or would it come out of council budget? How do we usually pay for those things? A couple of different ways could be charged to the council's budget just for record keeping and activity. And as much as we have a council liaison or, or otherwise we could charge it to the manager's office for the other various just <laughs> subscriptions and central charges. Yeah. So we have two, two different ways to do it. We would identify that a funding source for you in the, when we bring it back. Mm -hmm. And so I, I asked them that we, I asked our staff to have it on the February 28th as an agenda item. So. Really, what do you think the value of it is? So this has a little bit of history to it because, and that's a great question because that kind of went round and round with the group today. Uh, and Mayor Pro Tem, please <clears throat> give me information if I'm, uh, if I miss anything, but um, it sounded like, uh, and this is before this consultant happened, is that this was this group was established about a year ago, and um, it came from a variety of constituents and businesses about the noise. The, the air traffic has increased over the years significantly, and so our residents had come to council numerous times saying, "Please do something. Please be a part of this discussion." And so um, through council conversation and agreement, we joined this initiative um, to meet with surrounding areas to find ways to help mitigate this noise in um, the metropolitan area for Rocky Mountain Airport. Um, now, through a series of conversations um, through this group, they landed on 
uh, some actionable items that they'd like to see. Now, Boulder is looking at um, wanting it to be equitable for distribution of noise. I don't know how you can do uh, that in a airport setting. Um, and that's what kind of was the pushback today as far as how do you do that? Because there's strict regulations, not just at the county or state, or um, but it's at the federal level for aviation. And uh, they have to follow those aviation guidelines. Um, as far as flight pass, they also are competing with the um, Denver International Airport on flight pass. So um, this consultant is to, from my understanding, uh, and I've sent everything to council for, in more detail, but this consultant is to then work with the community to understand the background, the history, and then work with um, the airport as well as the federal levels to say, okay, is there any way that we can have mitigation? Here's some ways, here's some concerns, and just navigate all of that in one study really to say, okay, this is what you can do. This is what you can't do. Um, they also completed a business analysis last year um, for the airport. I don't recall what came of it. So I, I apologize that will have to maybe be in the background for our agenda on February 28th. But um, this is just one way to help address what's been brought to us on all levels at the elected level to say, how can you help? How can you help mitigate noise? Um, I don't know if there are solutions, but this group is supposed to be able to maybe identify. And, and part of that, like, so the conversation last time, last month, or no, it wasn't last month. We didn't meet last month. Whenever it was, we met last. They part of the conversation around getting a consultant was just what you were saying is instead of having like last year, they had a roundtable, but they had no actionable purpose. And so bringing the consultant in and actually hearing the all the feedback from the community, the different various staffs and the different various electeds, and businesses and stakeholders in general, they could then say, where can we push the needle to actually um, impact change? And I think to me, it made sense when they went through it. I mean, it's kind of a lift, but at the end of the day, you have a lot of horsepower in the room, but if you don't have any direction, it's just a bunch of people talking about people being upset and not really having anything actionable. So. Um, I recall most of the electeds being in favor of getting some sort of consultant, but I didn't know the first conversation they really dug into having some defined objectives as far as what they wanted to do with it, if we were going to put money behind it. And I think that was the conversation last time. I'm sure that continued today. And they didn't regurgitate a lot of that today, but it is in the documents that they forward to council um, for the consultants. There is a scope of work and should be a scope of work in each of those documents. I think ABC times two and then HMMH was the other one that um, were the two consultants that they're kind of looking at. Um, and both of them have their bids in those documents. So. Right. It's just my concern is what can they do? And I mean, if your judgment, you're our representative there, and I'm more than willing to follow what your lead is on it. It's just, I don't see what they can do. Yeah, and that might be something that we can maybe have in a briefing in the next council agenda, just kind of compiling all of what we are to date as far as what was accomplished to date in that group. Um, I think, and I would add, like if you you both probably remember, but it was before the new council was seated, the uh, head of the airport came and talked to us as well as some of the people from the county. And there are things they can do as far as just being good partners. Um, so I think that the goal of the consultant is figure out here are the concerns, what things can we actually do, or what things can we work do with our partners where they might um, voluntarily change some stuff to affect change. And that's kind of what the, the goal of the consultant is, is to figure out what things you actually can do. Because it is, I mean, at the end of the day, the federal government could say, here, here's what it is. And tough, but I think that you've seen from the conversation, I don't know if you guys remember that part when he came and spoke to us, he talked about the things that they can do as far as hours of operation, uh, like- Same with the training. Yeah, there was the a, a lot of things around it. I don't remember all the, there were significant details, but even like, I don't know, like how they run the planes and stuff, there was a lot of things that they can try to do to encourage, but maybe not mandate. And I think that was kind of one of the goals of, 
of bringing this consultant so they can kind of gather those details from the experts. Those are some of the things that have come up from um, Green Knowles group. Mm -hmm. They'd also like a testing of any lead with that. They're in that. So I would love, I don't know how much those tests run, but I'd love to do it just so we know it's done, dead, and we have an answer one way or the other. Mm -hmm. I also heard that too, just to understand the environmental impacts yeah. of the airport on the surrounding area, in addion to noise. Because um, yeah. if there is some, we need to know about it. If there isn't some, then they can sleep easy. Mm -hmm. And that's something that you know we can bring back and say as maybe a contingent point, we, we approve this, but we'd also like to understand how much it would cost to do a study or look into that. Yeah, did they do uh, for any expansion of the airport in the past in EIS? environmental impact statement uh, you but, have to on the federal level anytime that kind of work you have to do an eis but i don't know i'm sure they would have documents of it i mean we could reach out to i think it was ben miller is a representative for them so yeah we could reach out and have that as part of the document so it's just uh, i don't want to put up false of the really of the expectations mm -hmm. which are never going to be met and that's that was a that was a conversation that was had today as far as setting those expectations. And I think ultimately majority landed on this will help set the expectations for what we want and then um, set the expectations of the consultant to say no false hopes, just give us the the background of the, the problem, the potential solutions to solve or help mitigate the problem. And then here are some solutions forward. Did they say the cost of public consultant? Yeah, it's all in that stuff that I poured. I think the top one was about seventy thousand. So I think that was the HMM, HMMH. Um, the other one was ABC times two. There was a there was a um, hesitation moving forward with them because I guess they were. I guess Superior Boulder have been working with them for years and years and years. And they were looking at specifically transitioning to HMMH because it's completely outside of any situation that they've ever worked with, with all of us. So they were favoring more of the HMMH. So, and I hope I'm saying that accurately. Well, right. I mean, I will be probably against this unless there's something. I just think it's uh, a basically spending of funds, which we're not going to get anything for, and that's silly. Okay, that's fair. I would just invite you to look at the the details that I sent, and then let's have a, a further discussion okay. on the dais on two weeks from now. Okay. Anyone else have trouble with this coming to us in a form to vote on? Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any anything else? Nope, that was it. Uh, last week, I attended the um, uh, Rocky Flat Stewardship um, Council, and, and um, it's uh, still remote. And uh, Councillor Baker was on that too, as he is now one of the alternates. And uh, it was um, uh, it was the, the meeting where we get the huge quarterly updates on all the testing of all the sites, um, groundwater, vegetation. Uh, <clears throat> all the flow meters, all the testing, um, elk herd update, prairie dog updates, anything that, that lands, touches, moves, drips through uh, Rocky Flats was was uh, gone over. And then any uh, the updates that they do on a regular basis. And so it was very mundane and rote, I guess. You know, if you love that stuff and you, you know, by now I've got all the abbreviations from the Riffalama to this, this, that, and the other thing down. But, but um, all of those reports um, come in well, well within the specified ranges of the agreement that was signed when it was shut down. But um, the thing about that too is to go over all that. It's if any any of the testing sites in any way uh, exceeds any of the parameters, we get immediate notification. We get the stewardship council, every member of it, every we get an email and. So then the quarterly one, you know, it's going to be okay anyway. Yeah, it's okay. Things were fine, but here's what it looks like out there now. And 
some of the issues with, uh, you know, trying to maintain and, and upgrade and make sure every, all those testing sites work correctly is it's the big, you know, updating testing system, updating batteries and solar. And yeah, no, no big movement of anything out there now. Um, so it's, it's a, it's a great venue for the residents to have their comments on and, and so that we can keep an eye on that as, as adjoining cities. Um, there was, oh, there was a, a, a discussion, of course, what happens if the Marshall fire would have hit there? What's the response time on that? What's the emergency time? Who helps? What's the assisting and, you know, the whole process for that? And so that was just a quick update. Um, but there are, those things are in place, the expectation that there would be something like that happen and they have a process for it, so. Is there, I'm assuming they have a website where they post all of the mm -hmm. data? Mm -hmm. Yes, and I'm trying to remember if that's on, uh, it's not on the Stewardship Council site. I can look that up for you. We, we can send, I can send an email with some with some of the key links on it. Okay. And then yeah. maybe I sent a draft of that to Councillor Seymour first. You could look at it and make sure it's got all the stuff that, yeah. that you would have. Because we get the uh, Stewardship Council members get the reports directly to us. Mm -hmm. Uh, they're rather voluminous and you have to mm -hmm. rather yeah they're detailed i always like maps yep <laughs> and there's a lot of you know good pictures here's the elk here's more elk they don't have three eyes <laughs> nope nope no nope. they do quite a bit of damage out there though so that's an issue but yeah anything else that's it Councilor azadi <clears throat> so I'm looking forward, so, so as the liaison to the Human Services Board, I'm looking forward to the first meeting. I think it's in March. Um, I'm not sure if you know, Jody. I think it's next month. Um, and there are a lot of topics that I do want to cover or to see how that group has been operating and what they've been working on and the process, um, particularly for the grants, is interesting to me. Um, I'm continuing to have my office hours here at City Hall, and I uh, wanted to bring up that there's a new business in Westminster called the Medusa Collective. Um, they have a opening, so they're, so they're basically an art gallery space. They lease out to artists. They have exhibition opportunities and so forth. And that's one area that we've been talking about as a council. Um, one area that's very important to me is seeing how we can um, invigorate our arts, our creative class in the city. They have a opening on the 25th of February. Um, and I think that's an opportunity, not just them, but more events and um, chances like that for our local artists to connect and express themselves. So I, I'd, I'd like to see how we can, as a city, connect more of those businesses to the community, advertise these sorts of events and bring up more, uh, more things like that. So. Have you connected them with the chamber at all? Because they can help kind of market that opening. Um, so I'd also I'd look at the chamber and then I'd also look at connecting them with our North Metro Arts Alliance because they get funding from SCFD. CFD. Okay. CFD. I'm so sorry. Um, for, for arts type of funding. Um, and we already are connected with North Metro Arts Alliance, so that would be a good avenue to plug them into as far as um, potential grants or funding for artists. Um, I can, we have our, actually our meeting was Thursday, but they canceled it. So I could just send an email to Becky and, um, if that's something that you'd like me to follow up on with the group. Since yeah, for sure, if you can send me the contact, I could connect them. Um, they did ask if there are grant opportunities. So the current grant that they've gotten was just for the building from the um, the Westminster, I forgot the name of it, but a grant that just that focuses on only on restructuring and rehabbing the building itself. They're looking for a grant on equipment. Uh, if we have any, I sent you an email about that. So that's all I got. Thank you. Yeah, and I just clarified with staff, we did, we did give this the Medusa Collective a grant. Um, um, 30,000? 
I, I didn't get the amount. It's a small business improvement program, and it did help pay for some, or it can help pay for interior improvements as well. Oh, it can. It can. The one that we. They get. thought that it couldn't because there was some criteria that they couldn't use it for. We'll maybe not equipment, uh, but I'll I'll ask that our staff follow up with okay. them directly to make sure that they they are maximizing their benefit from the grant program. Um, I tend to report, although I'm attending a lot of the, the Dr. Cog and regional transportation meetings and everybody's just getting organized around the ARPA funding that's coming in. So it's a great opportunity, many, many years of um, funding and hopefully we'll be able to capitalize on some of that. Um, yeah, I did, I did happen to run across a new business yesterday, just randomly. Um, over by Frolic, <laughs> little business called Bella, and they do macarons, a little bakery. Yeah, yeah. They opened last week, so a little plug. Councilor yeah. <laughs> Jamal, um, we've got four minutes. I went to the inclusivity board virtually. They're still virtual. Still talking about when they're um, comfortable to be in person. Um, sounded like the majority of them still wanted to wait a little bit longer before they decided to be in person, which they still intend on trying to. Uh, meet with us. I shared with them about strategic planning, um, how that's probably a good opportunity for them to see how we can align. Um, Rich Newman joined them as well as it was the first meeting with Tomas joining them and uh, just gave them, they had a lot of questions about our update on homelessness um, that I shared with them. And then they went through their subcommittee work. So um, I think they have some things that they might send back our way sometime soon. Um, they did ask about there's been a lot of questions about the recorded meetings. I know I've brought up before in the past about um, my desire to see us start streaming all the different meetings. Um, I don't know if what we need to do in order to see if there's support to make sure that that actually happens, but I, I continue to think that that would be a good opportunity. So people who can't join the meetings while they're going could uh, benefit them afterwards. And that's it. And my, I know several of us were on the COVID calls last week um, telling Jeff Coe how we felt about some things. And um, then I, I talked to you about the yappers, but I wanted to make sure, because to me, this is just a no-brainer. They're looking at ways to outreach to other youth because we don't have kids from Stanley Road on the yappers. We don't have some of our, our own high schools. We don't have yappers. So they're thinking every way possible to connect with other teens. And so I told them about, we had just gotten the 30 bing, 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 bing of all the um, things that are going to be happening outside with the movies and all of the um, city things. So I explained to them, we don't have where we're going to pop up a tent and be at a movie or whatever. But if and when we do and have those dates, and I know it's over the summer, but they're willing to do it um, if a couple of them came and worked the booth with us and handed out their paperwork for how to apply. So even if it's a mom and dad, but they have a teenager at home, they can take it home to them. So I said we would love having them in our booth. So I hope that's okay. <laughs> um, they're a great group of people. I mean, we have, I've told you, we have... A Bandemir racer that has trophies everywhere. We have a young man that teaches Japanese on the internet. Um, he even was in Japan for a while, visiting a sick grandparent and still kept up his stuff. They're amazing folks. And the last thing I just want to say to our staff, um, I know we don't have to wear the masks in our two counties anymore, but I know some of you, um, have felt more comfortable doing it, please, just because it's your choice now and we don't judge. So if you are more comfortable wearing a mask, do it, just do it. Um, everybody has their own reasons. And so I just want you to feel comfortable. It's none of our expectations. It's what you feel comfortable with and what you, you need to do. So I just wanted to say that publicly. Let's go start a meeting. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode.
Welcome to tonight's meeting of February 14th, 2022. Happy Valentine's Day to everyone. And please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, please. Councillor Baker. Here. Mayor Pro Tem DeMott. Present. Councillor Emmons. Present. Councillor Azadi. Here. Mayor McNally. Here. Councillor Nermella. Here. And Councillor Seymour. Here. That brings us to the minutes of January 24th and February 7th. Councillor Nermella? No. Councillor Smith. I move to approve the minutes of the January. January 24th, 2022 meeting and the February 7th, 2022 special meeting as presented. Councillor Baker. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of January 24th and February 7th, 2022. Is there any further discussion? Councillor Seymour. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Uh, that brings us to public comment. Um, do we have people signed up? We do. Are you ready for the first speaker? Yep. Donna Werkheiser. Welcome. Hello. So I have been injured by the city of Westminster. Whoever agreed to the come and go project did not understand what the consequences would be of the homeowners who live on the east of the come and go. The retaining walls topped with the sound wall that were put in place east of the come and go made it a runway for water to drain into our yards. I've spent many restless nights with the worries about the project. It has been explained to me by the city that flat dirt filled sloping 
at a 1.3% to from north to south, now supposedly has, changed the draining 75% to the west, which drains the parking lot and will drain towards federal. The other 25% will drain to a 20 degree slope toward the homeowners to the east field. With nothing but a loose dirt swell that has already shown, it is, it's compromised. With the photos of the dirt being washed away, the city is holding $94,195 for those items to be fixed. Right now, Come and Go has agreed to fill in the dirt, which is just a temporary fix, but this does not address the problem. It's the only temporary cosmetic fix that makes it look a little better. I really need the situation to be made whole by the city of Westminster, standing up, admitting they messed up and fixing what is anonymously approved by someone who was not looking at the big picture. Um, I was in the meeting and, you know, heard about the airport, you know, trying to come up with a, so spent $600,000 to figure out why federal from 52nd to 120th is so bad. I don't know anywhere in there that said adding five to seven more, 7,000 more people to federal is going to help that situation. So I'm just kind of, you know, we've had the planting um, I brought up the last meeting that, I mean, there's a like a 53 page planning guide on how to plant. I brought pictures of the new park they put with the pine trees, plant it right next to the sidewalks, right near the bench, right under a tree. I was explained that the forestry and the parks all got together and put the best species to put in that park. Personally, I would not have put pine trees where kids play. They got sharp noodle, needles, they have sap, and they really don't make shade. I mean, they just enormous danger habits. But anyway, that's it. So hopefully I could get some help with this come and go because put, filling in a hole with dirt that has already been eroded away is not a solution. Thank you. The next speaker is Emily Brooks. Welcome. Thank you. Happy Valentine's Day. Same to you. Let me just say, I love our city and all of you that serve it, including the staff. Um, my comments tonight are on the water workshop that's on the post meeting agenda. I'd like to first comment on last week's study session when there was a premature attempt to place a rate or rate reduction ordinance on the agenda for council to vote on during tonight's meeting. Unless in-depth discussions are occurring outside of council's public meetings, it doesn't seem like the full council conducted the fact finding and deliberation that we expect when you are making a decision of this magnitude that will leave a mark on our city for many years to come. Thankfully, it was observed that council needed to actually know the details of the proposed ordinance and have discussion before agreeing to hold a vote. And the city attorney also noted that the language for such an ordinance could not be determined since council had not come to any agreement yet. And so tonight you will have that discussion after the council. Up for consideration is the third rate reduction proposal created by councilors Baker and Seymour and evaluated by staff. Importantly, while staff has performed analysis of this proposal, it is not put forward as their recommendation. The current proposal reduces rates at the cost of close to $6 million, reduction in annual water revenues, and over $2 million in annual sewer revenues. This is extremely troubling as it would position this critical asset of our city to further deteriorate without a real plan in place for the future that is fully described and documented so we can all understand the impacts of your decisions. The latest proposal also contains a provision to allocate water at a tier two rate based on three times the lot size. This seems like an arbitrary connivance created to justify a wasteful high usage of water for irrigation. What data supports introducing this complexity into our water billing system? I'd like to see a breakout of all the residential properties and how they will benefit from this scheme. Council recently toured the Semper Water Treatment Facility. 
I'd like to hear the mayor and counselors describe their observations and insights gained from the tour with respect to a need, the need to embark on the multi-year project of building a replacement facility. Council also paused or halted the Water 2025 treatment facility project for reconsideration. What risk assessment has been conducted by council of this action and what is your plan to ensure the safety and supply of water for residents and businesses? The staff report included for the post-meeting water workshop includes the following request. Staff would like city council's input about values, goals, and objectives how best to provide safe, reliable, and affordable drinking water and wastewater services to our residents in the short and long term, the trade-offs that exist for some of the discussion points listed above and the potential to impact, the potential impact to the city's bond ratings for future bond issues, water sewer, utility industry standards, for levels of service that are provided to residents and businesses, and opportunities and challenges that this specific rate reduction proposal presents. I think this gets right to the point. How do you intend to balance all of these needs? I support staff's request of council and I'm looking forward to your honest and transparent discussion and decision-making as you create your plan for our water system. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Carol Campbell. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor McNally, um, Mayor Pro Tem DeMott, and City Councilors. My name is Carol Campbell, and I'm a 40-year resident of Westminster, re residing in Legacy Ridge. Tonight, I want to touch on four issues. First of all, the proposed 22, 2022 changes for water rates. What is the technical basis for the baker Seamer rate proposal? What data was used to devise these rates? Our previous water rates that were in place until January 10th of this month, uh, last, last month, were developed based on a 2019 rate and fee cost of service study that was done by Raftelis. Raftelis found that in 2019, customers were paying 32% less than the city's cost to provide the water. Rate increases were pro proposed in an eight-year phased approach to manage, manage this cost differential. I am assuming that the 110-22 decision eliminating Tier 3 and costing Westminster's taxpayers $750,000 per year from the reserves is moot if this new baker Seymour proposal is adopted. This proposal seems arbitrary and capricious. And no, we did not co coordinate our comments with Emily. I was not aware that either counselor was a water engineer or an expert in water financing. The tier two rate proposal seems extremely difficult to manage as the city will have variable rates depending on lot sizes, which will require much work to calculate. These rate ch changes once again benefit the highest water users the most and decrease the city's water fund by almost $6 million per year. I'm extremely concerned that when it comes time to pay for the new water treatment plant, that we will not have the necessary funds due to these proposed decisions. If the council is concerned that residents cannot afford clean and safe water, then it should evaluate which residents need financial or technical assistance to minimize their water bills. A new rate and fee cost of service study by water experts should be performed to provide justification for any changes made. The council should not approve the Baker Seymour water rate changes, which could cause significant harm to the city's ability to provide clean and safe water to Westminster residents in the future. The next thing I want to touch on is the Semper Water Treatment Plan and land acquisition, land acquisition case. Now that you have had a tour of the Semper Water Treatment Plan, I assume you can now agree that our existing water treatment plant is past its useful life and that we need a new facility. Tonight's discussion focused on, or will focus on a re-review of the potential site locations and facilities needed including a reevaluation or re rehabilitation of the existing Semper facility. This reevaluation will cost the taxpayers $1.1 million in four months. This is a huge waste of time and money. 
There have been extensive studies, plans, and public processes culminating in the Water 2025 plan. The Semper facility was evaluated for use reuse in these previous studies. Between this 1.1 million reevaluation, the $6 million decreased rates proposed for the drinking water, and the increased time before any new plant would be built due to changes that may come from this reevaluation. I am extremely concerned about the city's ability to have a replacement plant in place in the needed amount of time. How will the city make up the $7.1 million in lost funds? Additionally, estimated costs for the replacement plant will increase due to the potential need for new construction plans and material cost increases due to the delays. The recent fire in Superior and Louisville emphasized that fire is a large threat in our watershed and we are not able to handle any issue to our so source water with our existing facility. What is the status of the land acquisition case for the site for the new water treatment plant? I know that the case was put on hold by a previous council decision. This case should continue so that the city can be ready to proceed with building if this site ends up being reaffirmed as the best place to build a new plant. I agree wholeheartedly with having the staff develop an enhanced conservation plan for ratepayers, including increased information, education, and incentives to encourage reduced home and business water consumption. I'm extremely concerned that both the director of public works and utilities and the utilities engineering manager are leaving shortly. I attribute both of these losses to bad decisions by this council. As a former EPA water director, I want to remind you that you may be personally liable for any decisions that you make that result in non-compliance of water or wastewater treatment systems, as well as significant per day penalties for the city and taxpayers. I am concerned that your decisions could affect future property values, health of our citizens, and our environment in Westminster. Thank you for the opportunity to comment. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lori Goldstein. Welcome. Hi, Lori Goldstein, and tonight I am representing the Board of Education of Adams 12 Five Star Schools. Wanted to come here tonight to give you some information about some of the things going on in Adams 12. It's been a while since we've been able to come here and report out to you. Adams 12 Five Star Schools has been rated a performance school district six years in a row. The state measurement includes academic achievement, academic growth, and post-secondary and workforce readiness. The five-star district has seen the greatest academic growth in that same six-year period as compared to districts with similar demographics. We've nearly doubled the number of career and technical education learning opportunities for our students through our Future Forward programs at our renovated Bowman campus and our new campus at Washington Square, thanks to voter support of our 2016 bond and our 2018 mill levy override. In the first year of the pandemic, we served more than 4 million free meals to the five-star community from March 2020 to the summer of 2021. During that same time, we made home visits to approximately 1,000 families to provide meals, basic resources, mobile hotspots, Chromebooks, and check down attendance and engagement in learning. In support of equitable access to technology for learning, all students now have their own district-issued Chromebook. We have some challenges. Like the state, we saw a dip in our graduation rate for the class of 2021. We, took, we looked to refocus our existing engagement initiatives with high schoolers to ensure that they are on track and on time to graduate. Adequacy and equitable funding for education continues to be a challenge. As a result of state budget cuts stemming from the Great Recession of a decade ago, the five-star district is receiving $27 million a year less, um, 27 million less in funding for the current year. While we're resource constrained, the needs of our students continue to grow. The number of homeless students in the district has gone from 2%, which is 694 students, to 4%, which is 1,335 students of the student population over the last decade. We have some initiatives going on right now. One is our five-star equity review focused on race. It's a natural extension of our strategic plan, Elevate, which we implemented a couple of years ago. 
Equity review goal is to ensure access, opportunity, and a sense of belonging for each student and staff member. We are reviewing, our review includes analyzing existing data, reviewing current policies and practices, and developing a deeper understanding of the experience of staff, students, and families through surveys, listening sessions, focus groups, and site visits. Our progress to date is that we have 79 policies that we've reviewed, 15,671 families, staff members, and students completed a survey, seven student listening sessions held to date, 21 to be held in total, 10 staff listening sessions, five family listening sessions. And as far as discipline, course enrollment, staff attrition, and staff development data is being reviewed and analyzed. We anticipate sharing findings and recommendations with the five-star community before the end of this school year. Our other initiative is called Blueprint 2032 is an important aspect of ensuring access, opportunities, and a sense of belonging for all students, providing academic pathways and facilities that support this goal. Over the next two years, Adams 12 Five Star Schools is developing Blueprint 2032, a comprehensive long-range academic plan and facilities plan. The Blueprint 2032 Task Force brings together a diverse group of students, parents, staff, civic leaders, community members, and business leaders to help guide the process of creating this plan. In the fall, more than 4,000 parents, students, staff, and community members shared feedback on priorities and needs, both in terms of district facilities and academic programs, and here are a few highlights. When asked to rate which learning spaces are most important to them when it comes to potential renovations, respondents at the elementary, middle, and high school levels routine, routinely ranked renovations to general learning environments, technology spaces, as well as STEM and CTE spaces as being their highest priority. About 75% of the respondents rated their satisfaction level with their facilities as good or excellent. When asked to identify their top priorities when it comes to school security features, traffic flow patterns, additional security cameras, and improved building cellular services were all ranked the highest. So that's just in a nutshell, some of the things going on in Adams 12, and we'll be in touch with more. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming tonight. It's great to be in touch with each of our school districts, but thank you for taking the initiative for coming. Sure, and I left a copy of our Focus on Five Star Schools. Perfect, thank you. Our next speaker is Karen Calavity. Welcome. Hello, Hello my name is Karen Calavity, 9940 West Cliff Parkway. Um, I wanna speak a bit about um, home rule city and what that means, because I really don't know what that means. It seems to mean that um, Westminster can kind of make up rules as it goes along. And um, that doesn't seem quite right. Uh, we were recently involved with a referendum process with regard to the uplands. And uh, we kind of did that as a reaction, a reaction to the vote by this council, which shocked most of the people um, involved that it, it, the, the uplands was even approved. Um, so we went to the referendum route to see if we could correct that uh, by referring it to the voters. And it turns out the referendum process in Westminster is so prohibitive as compared to most cities. And I'm curious as to how that, that can actually be. Um, citizens should have a right to correct what they feel is a wrong. And the standards in the state are 5% of the people who voted in the last election, uh, you need to get signatures within 90 days. And in Westminster, it's 10% of the registered voters uh, at the last time of the last election in 30 days. And in this instance, that was a difference between 1,500 that would be required by the state um, referendum process compared to 8,500 plus that were required in 30 days in a Westminster process. And that's pretty unrealistic. It, it just, you know, and it, to me, it was pur purposely set up to be prohibitive uh, to, to be able to correct things through a referendum process. Um, also, I have concerns about these special session meetings. To me, it's 
like, what are these sneaky session meetings? I, I mean, if they're not really announced to what is going to be talked about and there's no public input um, at these meetings, that's very concerning. I, I just, anything that's voted on should at least have some, some public input with regard to it. You know, I expect that, that to be ignored, quite frankly, by this city council, but it's still as a matter of course should be allowed. Um, anyway, I have some concerns about home rule cities like Westminster and what is actually legal for them to pursue and what is just kind of willy nilly to, to suit the purpose at hand. Thank you. The next speaker is David Acunto. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening, honorable members of council. My name is David Acunto, address of 8400 Alcott Street. I come to you tonight as the president of the Westminster FOP Lodge 25. <clears throat> and I speak in favor of agenda item 10A, Councilor's Bill number 12, amending title one of the Westminster Municipal Code, the addition to collective bargaining for police officers. As indicated in your council packet, in June of 2021, the members of the Westminster FOP 25 overwhelmingly voted to pursue collective bargaining with the city. We wanted meaningful dialogue. We wanted effective management that did not ignore the voices of our police officers and the ability to communicate in a candid manner, enhance pay and benefits, and the opportunity to collectively work with the city staff to enhance the Westminster Police Department's workplace environment. Directed by council at the end of 2021, city staff began to work with the Westminster FOP in drafting an ordinance which mirrors the current firefighters ordinance. This ordinance is the foundation which has led to many successful mutual beneficial contracts with the fire department since its inception. This ordinance does in fact support the city of Westminster's strategic plan. It has proven to be successful not only within the city in the case of the fire department, but in neighboring jurisdictions as well. This ordinance will help meet the mutual, mutual goals set forth by the city and the police officers in establishing the initial framework to address workplace environment, professional development, training, safety related equipment, fair and sustainable police wages and benefits, and pol most importantly, police recruitment and retention. Honorable members of council, if your actions inspire others to dream more, learn more and become more. You are in fact a leader. Please be a leader tonight. The, Westminster, the members of the Westminster FOP support city staff's recommended action of passing this ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. The next, next speaker is Tim Pegg. Welcome. Thanks, hello. Um, so, uh, before I get to what's in my notes, uh, the first thing I wanted to address was, uh, Bruce Baker's email that showed up in the Westminster window. Um, it's hard for me to imagine a more flagrant attempt to violate Colorado's, uh, open meeting statute. And I'm extremely disappointed. But what I'd really like to address tonight is Mayor Pro Tem DeMott's comments regarding water rates, which were printed in the January 24th edition of the Westminster window. Um, he said, I object really adamantly to the idea that people who are in that third tier are in a certain income bracket. This comment is missing the point. The mayor pro tem has previously made several comments expressing concern about the burden of water rates on homeowners of large lots. No doubt the owners of large lots have different incomes, but there is no escaping the fact that land area has monetary value. So the owners of large lots own more and by owning more, they have more choices available to them. Broadly speaking, it's hard for me to understand why their choice to use more water should be subsidized and that burden placed on everyone else. However, there might be room for the mayor pro tem and I to agree. In the same article, he's quoted saying, you have people who have lived decades in the same home who now all of a sudden have these huge water bills. And it's really impossible to talk about folks who have lived in their home for a long time without talking about senior citizens. I think that it's okay for government to give a break to those who are in need. And if we agree that seniors deserve a break on their water rates, then Westminster should create a program to implement that. But it's not enough to give senior citizens a discount. 
Neglecting our water utility in the name of helping is, is frankly idiotic. Instead, I think the city council should do their homework and seek to raise the rates of other water users in order to offset this lost revenue. Additionally, any discount program implemented should probably be time limited. At some point, everyone paying their fair share for water should be the new norm. To be explicit about what I'm proposing, I propose a discount program for West Westminster residents over age 65 to blunt the impact of needed ongoing improvements to the water utility. I think that folks who enroll in the program should receive discounted water rates for as long as they live in Westminster, but that folks can only enroll for a limited time, say until the beginning of 2028 or so. Non-discounted water rates must be raised accordingly to offset the reduced revenues from this limited number of customers. A program like this would provide a break to senior citizens without neglecting our water utility. And I hope that city council will consider implementing it. Thanks for your time. Thank you. The next speaker is John Palmer. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor, Councilors, Mr. Andrews. <clears throat> I'm here to talk about items on the agenda 11 A, B, and C, starting with item A, the Semper Gardens project that was approved at the last council meeting. I find it insulting to the people that lived in the area, they, that worked with the developer, that made a plan, they agreed with the developer, R5 maximum, and no townhomes that went through the planning commission. The planning commission approved that additionally with, with the R5 and no townhomes. <clears throat> at the reading, the first reading of this at the 11th hour staff, city staff comes in and overrides the planning commission saying that they would rather see townhomes and have the density increase to R8 wasn't fair to the residents, wasn't fair the time they put in, the concessions they made with the developer to make that happen. And then they got slapped in the face at the 11th hour. Okay, <clears throat> moving on to item B. We've talked about this before, the rezoning. <clears throat> I'm, I wish you'd reconsider your vote on that item due to the simple fact that I brought before you that it did not meet city code in regards to it being published in the official city newspaper at least one time out of the five times it was ran. <clears throat> Direct violation of city code to which you all took an oath saying you would uphold the city code. Let's move along to C. Uplands is asking for an extension on their project. The reason they stated they wanted an extension was because of the referendum, possible legal actions from the, the referendum. Well, as you just heard, the referendum fell through. Therefore, I believe anything in, in this item C should, should be dropped and voted against. There's no need to give them extra time. The, the, there's no legal recourse being, being weighed out here. <clears throat> They've had two years to get their paperwork and finances in order. If there's a problem there, that's not with the city. That's with them and pillar of fire. Why should the city have to bear that burden of, of whatever they're trying to do here? I mean, it is, it's the bottom line. They don't have the money and they're trying to buy more time at the expense of the city. <clears throat> I just read in the paper today, Farmland in Colorado has gone up 24% over the last year and is expected to continually grow up, grow in value. It's a money grab if we just keep letting them go on and on. We can't keep cowtowning to, to Jeff Hanlon and the O'Ree people. We've done it several times now. It's time for it to stop. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Steve Odoricio. Good evening, Commissioner. Thank you. My name is Steve Odorisi. I'm one of the county commissioners of Adams County. I'm here speaking on my own behalf, though. 
Um, more importantly, I'm a former prosecutor in the 17th Judicial District. During that time, I got to work with many police officers. Tonight, I'm here to support collective bargaining for our police officers. During that time, as a prosecutor in the 17th Judicial District, I heard many stories, saw many stories of heroism, bravery, and sacrifice, whether it was cops from Commerce City who'd come into the courthouse after the second or third shift from sifting through landfill just to look for the body of a dead baby. Or in North Glen, where I saw and learned about the cops who ran into a burning building to save the children and the family dog from a domestic abuser who wanted them to be burned alive. Or the folks in Aurora who ran towards the theater, took bullet riddled, riddled bodies into their own cars, drove them to the hospital, saving dozens of lives. And then I remember the folks in Westminster Police Department coming into the courthouse, just absolutely drained after spending every hour, every minute, and every ounce of energy that they had to try to find Jessica Ridgway. These are the stories that I remember when I was a prosecutor, and they're still stories that happen every day. I ask that you support those folks in law enforcement, the police officers who sacrifice and who risk everything for the protection of our families. So I think that bargaining, collective bargaining for the police officers could be a very good step to showing these people who sacrifice everything for our benefit that we want to find good people. We want to find good training. And we want to find good equipment for these folks. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next speaker, Shannon Bird. Welcome, Representative. Well, good evening, council members, mayor, staff, city manager, Andrews. Um, it's so good to be here. I think this is the first time I've been back to council chambers since I was on the other side of the dais, and it's such a privilege to be here. Um, first, I want to start by thanking you all for what you do. I know the work is um, always very difficult, um, sometimes rewarding, but it's quite a challenge. And so I do want to express personal gratitude for everything you're doing for our city. I here also um, am here for two reasons. Also to echo the sentiments expressed by our County Commissioner, Steve Odoricio. I also am in support of our police officers having collective bargaining rights and would like to express um, a wholehearted endorsement of their effort. I remember when I was on council, how important this was for our firefighters and what a strong tool this was to giving our firefighters a seat at the table, an opportunity to really have a say in, um, in resource allocation, which really was important to making sure they had what they needed to be safe, to do the job competently and expertly. Um, I, I have strong affection for our police department. I know um, the caliber of the men and the women who serve as uh, public safety professionals for the city of Westminster and giving them a seat at the table, I think would be one of the strongest endorsements of the value that they add to our city. In addition to that, I'd love to give you all a very short update on some of the work that I'm doing um, for our city and for our state. Um, one of these does relate to public safety. I know many of us on council and in our city um, are very supportive of the work of our school resource officers. A bill that I'm working on right now um, that seeks to start gathering additional data that highlights a lot of the positive work that our police officers are doing with students in the classroom. Right now, police officers or school resource officers, rather, when they're working in schools, they're required to collect a lot of data. And most of the data is skewed towards um, times when students are referred for, for um, like criminal referrals or uh, uh, punishments and those kinds of things. This bill would standardize some data collection and, and include positive interactions because we know that doesn't tell the whole story about the value added that our police officers do in the classroom. Um, they are mentors. They are some of the first responders. They're people who refer students to resources and connect families and, and students, whether it's to food or to counseling or even saving children from situations of domestic abuse. So we need to recognize the good and this bill seeks to make sure that when we're collecting data, we're telling the whole story or at least a much better, a, a much fuller picture of the work that they're doing. Um, another bill that I'm working on relates to the affordable housing tax credit. I know this is a resource that our city has competed for um, in different circumstances to fund the construction of affordable housing. Right now, um, we have a, a cap on that tax credit 
that is $10 million. My bill, which I'm running, it's a bipartisan bill with minority leader Hugh McKean. He and I um, have a bill that will lift that cap up to $15 million and extend the expiration of that program out until 2034. So that resource will be around and be something for the city of Westminster should it decide that it wants to compete for more of that funding. Um, another big bill that I'm running, um, I'm not certain whether any of our city staff are members of um, the PARA plan, but this is um, a bill to add additional funding to our state's retirement plan and try to pay down the state's unfunded liability. So stay tuned, there's more to come on that. I could continue with this, but I will save it for a town hall and just leave you with this again, an expression of gratitude for all that you do for our, our city. And I hope to be back soon. Thanks. Thank you. The next speaker is Doris Weiss. Welcome. Um, Doris Weiss, I live at 4402 West 100th Avenue in Highland Greens East. I'm a resident uh, um, here 11 years. I haven't prepared any uh, documents, uh, but I want to express my concerns about the water situation. Um, I don't want to become, I don't want Westminster to become a Flint, Michigan, but we have to use bottled water. I'm concerned that you're reducing the funding to maintain the existing water facility and that you're not building the new water facility that we need. I, I you know, my husband, he's very particular about the water taste and he's now uses only filtered water to make his coffee because the water that comes out of the tap doesn't taste good to him. And it used to taste great to me, but it's not tasting that good to me now either. So I don't understand what's going on, but I just wanna tell you, I'm a concerned citizen. Now I have, I, one of the proposals I heard was that you're going to uh, make the rate based on the size of your property. Well, I have a small lot, but I have a pond and I fill my, I top the pond up and I should be paying extra for doing that. You know, we use a lot more water, even though our lot is smaller. So I don't think basing a water rate based on, a, on the size of your lot is an appropriate um, way to provide rating. The rate should be based on your use. You know, you use more water, you pay more, and I'm willing to pay more. But, you know, I, and if I don't want to, then I can take the pond out and do something different in my backyard. You know, it's my choice to do that. But you should be concerned about funding the, the plant and the facilities that we need. Don't skimp on that now so we pay in the future. You may satisfy some people who wanted to reduce their rates now, but then you, you know, you're not looking forward to the future about what's going to be happening down the road. And, you know, when you leave office then the rest of us are going to, you know, we're going to have to be stuck with what happens based on your decisions. And I'm asking you to make good decisions that will make sure that we have enough money to build the plan properly, because if you're going to skimp on the rates, then you're going to wind up taking the money from someplace else and someplace else is going to suffer from it. So I don't, I just think you need to do the right thing and think about the future and not just about the immediate um, opportunities that you're looking at to satisfy some people. And I, I agree with this other young man who came up to speak who said that, you know, the senior citizens have a finished, I'm a senior citizen and I, and I have friends who um, have issues with the rate increase in the water. You know, a friend of mine said his rate went up like two or three times and he was quite upset about it. But I think it's a good idea, if, you know, for seniors who are in fixed income, give them a, some kind of grant or, uh, you know, some kind of relief for their water rates. But I don't need that. And it should be, it should be uh, means tested. You know, in other words, if you have the income and you have the money, you should pay. And that's what I'm asking that you do is consider the future and not just today. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Kyle Mullica. Welcome. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, City Council. Um, my name is Kyle Mullica. I'm the state representative for House District 34. Uh, I want to start off by saying happy Valentine's Day. Um, Same to you. Thank you. Um, and and I'm here to testify or to speak in, in support of collective bargaining officers. Uh, 
I was sitting uh, with my wife tonight, uh, uh, talking through that I was going to have to leave on Valentine's Day night to to come testify in support of collective bargaining. And you can imagine maybe the looks I was getting or the stink eye, I think maybe is a better uh, better word for it. But she asked me what I was going to say. Um, and I started off that I wanted to talk about what it meant to me, that my family means everything to me, my kids and my wife. And I'm an ER nurse outside of being a state legislator. And I remember several years ago when uh, this pandemic started and there was so much unknown. Uh, and when we went on recess down at the Capitol, I went right back to the ER. And I remember the fear that I had going into patients' rooms. I remember seeing the fear on my colleagues' eyes going into those rooms because we didn't know what we were dealing with. And, and I think about police officers, and, I, and our police officers have families themselves. And I think about when somebody's breaking into my house, I'm going to call them, and they don't know me from Joe Schmo. And their whole goal, just like my goal as a nurse, is to get home to their family at night too. And they're going to come protect me and, and put their life on the line. And they don't know me. And I think that that says a lot. And that's why I'm here tonight is because if I have the opportunity to support them in any how I can, then that's what I want to do. And I think that that's what we should do. You know, there is, they have an ask, an ask that they want to seat at the table. Um, and I don't think that's too much. I think that, that we should listen. We know how hard it's been. It, it was hard to be a police officer, I think. Pre-pandemic, we know that this pandemic has shined a, a brighter light in a number of different areas. If you're a teacher or a nurse or especially a police officer, um, and we need to be doing all that we can to take care of the people that are taking care of us, that are protecting and serving our communities. And I think that this is an opportunity. Um, you know, and we speak a lot about heroes. We speak a lot about people that that step up. And obviously, we heard about that from you know from nurses and and others, but specifically from our police officers and. You know, I, I take this mindset when 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 I was called to ask and 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 speak on this that that when when heroes speak, we should listen. And and when heroes have an ask, then we need to have an answer. And you know, I I think that you all have an opportunity to have that answer and to really show that appreciation to these heroes who put their lives on the line to protect our community and do so much for us. Um, and this is a great opportunity. And I I strongly encourage you, and I hope to see you guys pass this collective bargaining and making sure they have a seat at the table. And hopefully, we're, you know, you guys have that opportunity to really show the appreciation. And um, and so that's what I came here to do. I, I appreciate you giving me the time to, to say those words. And uh, I, I hope to see this, this pass. Thank you. Thank you. That's the last person we had signed up to speak live. And do we have any voicemails? We do. We have one voicemail. Okay. This is Chris Stimson, uh, living in Cotton Creek. I understand that two members of city council have done what experienced professional consultants and knowledgeable city staff have apparently not been able to do in the last couple of years and produced a water and sewer rate plan to please the masses. Besides the earlier elimination of a rate tier for those residents who don't understand that water is not an inexhaustible commodity, we now have proposed rate reductions for the rest of us. A combined annual revenue reduction for this proposal totals nearly $6 million. I looked but could not find where in the proposal documentation the councillors were proposing to fund necessary water and sewer infrastructure work, nor how the city under this proposal would be financing the replacement of the Semper water treatment plant. Of course, since the majority of council doesn't seem to agree with the public work specialists that the 50-year-old plant needs replacing, perhaps this doesn't matter. And of course, since these across-the-board rate reductions were a salient element in the election campaigns of these councillors which gained them seats on city council, again, perhaps this doesn't matter. I have news for the city council. I do not want my water rates reduced. In 2021, my water and sewer rates averaged $48.98 per month. This is not because I have allowed my property to decay into unsightliness, but because I've modified its components to more accurately and responsibly reflect the climate zone and climate era in which we live. If my Tier 1 rate, note that I did not enter Tier 2 in 2021, if my tier one rate is reduced from $3.96 to $3.42 per thousand gallons per month, 
I will save 91 cents per month. And if I cut out one Starbucks coffee per week, I can probably manage that. This vote-grubbing proposal is the worst, most irresponsible sort of behavior by government officials imaginable. Unless, of course, you count breaking laws such as the Colorado Sunshine Law, but then surely no one on the podium would do such a thing as that. Thank you. Thank you. And in case there's anyone in the audience that didn't know how to sign up or didn't get signed up, but has something to share, now's your time. Come on down. Not seeing anyone. That brings us to report of city officials. Mr. Andrews. Thank you, Mayor. Mayor Pro Tem, City Councilors. I do have a few comments tonight. First, I would like to thank City Council for your involvement and leadership on the water-related issues that we face as a city. Staff has appreciated the commitment that you've made to get the information you need to inform your deliberations, including last Thursday's tours of the Municipal Service Center and our Northwest Water Treatment Facility and your earlier tour of the Semper Water Treatment Facility. Continuing this work, tonight's post-meeting agenda includes an interactive water rate modeling workshop, as well as a staff report to investigate options for rehabilitating the current Semper water treatment facility as an alternative to replacing it at a different location. Also this week on Thursday night is our water leadership roundtable in which former city leaders and regional utility providers will join you to add their perspective to, and their input to your deliberations. The panel of participants at the roundtable includes two former Westminster city managers, a former Westminster water treatment superintendent, and representatives from Denver Water and the city of Greeley. The roundtable is scheduled from 5.30 to 7.30 p.m. at the City Park Recreation Center, is open to the public, and will also be live streamed. In addition to water-related matters, staff has been hard at work delivering on City Council's strategic priorities and is finalizing preparations for your second strategic plan workshop next Tuesday, February 22nd at 5 p.m. We're excited about the draft city vision and mission statements you developed at your first session two weeks ago and are eager to help finalize our new strategic plan and get working on those priorities for you. Um, as your interim city manager, I will tell you that this work is our highest priority and we are doing everything we can to provide you with what you need to be responsive to your expectations and those of our community. Finally, I would like to acknowledge and thank representatives from the Fraternal Order of Police for being here tonight, including Mr. David Acunto, who spoke regarding item 10A. And that is, of course, the first reading of Councillor's Bill Number 12 regarding collective bargaining for Westminster's police officers. I'd like to thank Mr. Acunto and his colleagues for their work to represent Westminster police officers and our shared interest in that regard. Thank you, sir. That's all I have tonight, Mayor. Thank you. Any questions? Brings us to City Council comments. Anyone? Councillor Nermella? Um, well, and I just I appreciate all the public input tonight and as well as um, the emails that we get uh, throughout the week. So um, keep it coming. Um, I do want to just ask with respect to um, you know, school districts providing updates, um, is there more of a focused venue where we could, you know, give them more than five minutes to provide us with updates? And, um, you know, does that expand to other organizations that are working hard in our community? Like I think of Growing Home, for example. I just, um, you know, there's a lot of good happening and I'd love to be able to hear about it when people aren't on a timed clock. I know in the past we've had um, dinner with all three school districts and just had a night to share where the partnerships can happen, um, what each of us are doing, just have a free for all of questions and, and comments back and forth. It's very wonderful, I think. Um, we can do anything we wish to do. Um, I just remind us our first priority is getting a city manager and we will be starting that process next month, um, March 10th for interviews. So um, if we book everything up, we won't ever get that process done. So I cautiously say, yes, let's get that planned, but maybe in a few months, maybe get it on the calendars. Yeah. And I, I you know, I, in a venue where the community can hear too, I don't, you know, um, 
a, you know, a dinner is one thing, but I also like the, uh, you know, which is great for us to build relationships and think of partnerships. Um, but I'd love to just have a, a time squirreled away at some point on a study session. Maybe it's like um, an annual opportunity before the school year starts or, you know, some, some time for people to just, yeah, provide us with that update. You'll put it on your list of things we need to look at. Yes, Mayor, Mayor thank you. Um, to, to your point, I saw Manager Andrew shaking his head. That is a practice that we've done since I've been on council as well. And typically, they'll bring all the school boards together and let them present to us, and we get to present to them and have a nice collaborative discussion about how we can partner with each other. So I always look forward to doing that as well as the meeting with our county commissioners. Um, thank you to everybody who loves the city enough to show up tonight on Valentine's Day. Um, it, it's a testament to the kind of city we have. Um, and I, I hear your concerns, and I know we all do. We've done a lot of work. I know this last week I did a second tour of our Northwest water plant, which was uh, the passion that our staff has. Um, we heard things like there's a, a they're big tubes, which they call modules, that each have 5,000 different membranes in them that are seven feet long, that are about the size of less of probably smaller than a piece of spaghetti. And those are what filter the water when they go through that plant. But point being is the work that council is doing about looking at what the future of the water is, is very serious work. And I think everybody up here takes it very serious as well as our staff does. Um, so I think that we're hearing your concerns and we have the same concerns in trying to balance affordability as well as the safety of our drinking water is important to us. Um, the comment um, we heard about, you know, us when we're done here, I'm going to still live here when I'm done here. I've lived here since uh, my parents brought me home from the hospital, and mm -hmm. I intend to, to stay in the city. Um, so, you know, that that is important to my family as well as my my parents who still live in the city, and I just want people to know we're, we're listening. Um, I also wanted to make comments since it was uh, commented about something I said about lot sizes. I really would encourage conversation and I'd be happy to sit down with anybody about their thoughts on that and share mine because I can tell you there's a, a, a house in my neighborhood, which I bought my home for $170,000 at the end of the recession of, of the housing market. And that how my house is well worth over 500 now. And at the same time, somebody bought a home just around the corner from me, exact same house. They got it for less money than I did because of the, the way that they were able to acquire it their lot is twice the size as mine, even though it's the exact same model. Um, so all things being land and property, home values don't always equate what the lot size is. So there's a, a variety of, of um, economic uh, income levels at different lot sizes. Go down into the historic part of the town, um, you know, where property value might be different than the northern part of town. There's huge lots because that's how they used to build homes. They used to be that they would grow or have big lots and they grow their own food. And you see a lot of that in the historic part of our town. So it's not a one size fits all. It's there's a lot of gray in the conversation. And I just share that all because I want you all to understand how serious I take this. And I know my colleagues do as well. And I look forward to us continuing the conversation and coming up with the best Westminster solution. Councilor Izzati. Thank you, Mayor. I just want to <clears throat> echo the uh, thank you to the community for coming out and giving your uh, comments, including the all-star lineup that came about local officials and the powerful testimonies. Um, really appreciate that. I just wanted to say that I'm, I'm looking forward to the job training incentive grant discussion in our post meeting today. Um, as everyone knows, this has been a priority of mine since day one. And I, I think that making available a skilled workforce um, can help us to not only keep a strong employment base, but have our economic base get diversified and will help us to create a, the most exciting economy in the Denver Metro, which is one of my goals. And I know that the rest of council would agree to that. So I'm looking forward to that. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? I just wanted to say, uh, Councillor Seymour and I were at, thank you, a very French bakery right straight across the street uh, on the north side of H Mart. It is the best. Just be hungry. And, you know, they opened. They opened during COVID 2020. And they have bumper to bumper people going through there. 
they have the best stuff. And knowing the food industry as I do, I looked at what they had and I said, this used to sit out and people would just pick what they wanted in their basket and bring it up to the, he said, yes. I said, you had to totally rethink packaging. And he said, yes. And it's beautiful what they've done. It is safe. It is wonderful food. I just, if you, and it's not um, gooey sweet. It's just perfect. It's, it's great. So I had to say we were there and got to taste everything and it was delicious today. That brings us to, I think I haven't missed anything. The consent agenda. Um, these are items that we don't routinely and we don't have anything on the consent agenda, do we? Yeah, Andy. Oh, gotcha. Um, and so uh, do we have a motion to adopt consent agenda items 8A or B and B? Councillor Seymour. I move to adopt consent agenda items 8A and 8B. Mayor Pro Tem. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adopt consent agenda items 8A and 8B. Is there any further discussion? Roll call, please. Councillor Baker. Mayor Pro Tem DeMott. Yes. Councillor Emmons. Yes. Councillor Azadi. Yes. Mayor McNally. Yes. Councillor Nermella. Yes. And Councillor Seymour. Yes. The motion passes on a 7 0 vote. That brings us to item 9A. Councillor Seymour. I move to appoint Kurt Alstead to the Metro Water Recovery Board of Directors with a term of office effective immediately through June of 2022. Councillor Emmons. Second. Been moved and seconded to pass Councillor's bill or um, item, item 9A. Is there any further discussion? Roll call, please. Mayor Pro Tem DeMott. Yes. Councillor Emmons. Yes. Councillor Azadi. Yes. Mayor McNally. Yes. Councillor Nermella. Yes. Councillor Seymour. Yes. And Councillor Baker. Yes. The motion passes on a 7 0 vote. Thank you. That brings us to um, 10A. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mayor. I move to pass Councilor Bill number 12 on first reading, amending Title I of Westminster Municipal Code by the addition of Chapter 35 regarding collective bargaining for the police officers. Councilor Seymour. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve Councilor's Bill number 12. Is there any further discussion? Councilor Seymour. Oh. Oh. Councilor Baker. Yes, uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I will be voting against this measure because I think the uh, very important group of people that have not weighed in and on the fire department issue that was the same were allowed to weigh in is the voters. I think we are doing our voters a disservice if we do not include them. Thank you. Thank you. Comes, or Mayor Pro Tem. Um, I just wanted to take a, a second to first thank the people who came here to speak in support of this. To thank city management and the chief's office for working hard to get us where we're at, as well as the fine men and women of the Fraternal Order of Police. Um, and most of all, thank the law enforcement that work for the city of Westminster and throughout Colorado. Um, I am the son of a police officer, retired, and I know full well the risks that you all go through. My dad served 14 years as a homicide detective in the city of Denver during the summer of violence. For those of you who have been in Colorado to know about the mid nineties and how horrible it was. So um, there were times when he would get called out, he'd be out for days on a homicide. He'd come home for maybe an hour, get called out again, because that's uh, what we were looking at in the mid nineties. So the work that you all do, I think is important. And I think it, it will make our police department a stronger department to be able to have your voices at the table when it, it comes to the things that this will cover. And I look forward to the process that you all will go through. Councillor Smith, or uh, Emmons. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> yes, Emmons. Uh, I also want to echo my gratitude uh, for our police department. Lord knows that uh, over the past couple of weeks, you've all uh, offered me a level of comfort that uh, cannot be explained. So I just wanted to uh, thank you and even in our roll calls uh, that we can we do over the course of the year. Um, I, you know, it's never enough just to say thank you. Uh, so I just wanted to take an extra moment to explain my gratitude in all that you do for our community. 
in a variety of different ways, whether that is taking time to uh, sit down with a constituent and understand concerns, or whether that is uh, going into a, a building with domestic violence um, and not understanding the situations that you're going into. Um, just thank you for selfless, selflessly doing what you do. Um, to that end, um, it's no surprise that I've explained uh, to many, including in roll calls, that I'm not particularly fond of CBAs um, or fa in favor because I have worked um, in many instances of uh, executing CBAs. They can be very difficult in a lot of nuances in putting them together as well as executing. However, uh, in understanding this background um, and understanding what our PD has gone through and all of the uh, strides that they have done within um, not only the city, but within the community. Um, I understand that background. And I think that this is important to reflect what we already have with our fire department. Um, and I think that it brings to what uh, FOP President Akunto had mentioned that um, this will bring more effective communication with management um, and will bring more meaningful ways to have uh, discourse and conversation. And that's why I will be in favor of this tonight. Thank you. Um, for me, <clears throat> I shared last meeting, um, I've been inside negotiations four times and the first three were with caucus-based negotiations and the last one was interest-based and there is a big difference. And um, Mr. Acunto, when you mentioned um, you want meaningful dialogue, I know that um, the only way to meaningful dialogue is when everybody sits at the table, not in their own rooms, and when you have to talk through the scenarios. I just remember so well, there's five of us that have gone through uh, the Citizens uh, Alumni or Citizens Academy for the police department. And there's no way we could understand and begin to even think of walking in your shoes if it wasn't for those classes, because you shared with us, you, you take us right to the edge of your decision-making, how in a less than a millisecond, you have to decide my life or someone else's or what else can you do? It is so scary how, what you bring in those classes. And so the only way I believe it can be done and, and I'm glad that the fire department has used it and I hope you have talked with them and they have found um, positiveness in using the interest-based. To me, that's what we have to have is people sitting face to face and helping each other understand because both sides are going to have different issues of of the whys and hows and and we if it's not like a family where you sit down and put it all on the table we don't get anywhere and so um i just hope you take that into consideration as um you all move forward and um i'll be voting in favor yes sir oh. councilor Izzati. Thank you, Mayor. I just want to say that if there's anyone in this room that has a reason to not support this, it, it would be me. I fully support this a thousand percent. Um, when I was 10 years old, I was brutalized by police. And as I laid there with a bloody face, um, this was back in New Jersey where I grew up. <clears throat> um, the one thing I remember wishing was for myself to have a seat at the table. And now that I do, I know that collective bargaining is a human right. And the police department that deserves the same rights as our fire department and as many other private sector employees have um, for sure. So I'm in full support of this and I just want to say that uh, I really appreciate the majority here supporting this as well. Councillor Numella. Yeah, I just want to um, kind of echo what Councillor Azadi said too. You know, I've had over the years, you know, some good experiences and some, you know, not many, but some bad experiences um, with, uh, you know, with the police uh, force, but um, not Westminster's in particular. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I, it is a right that I feel like the, um, our police department should have and having some agency over how, you know, how they, how they are able to, um, build their force and support one another and communicate with one another. 
Um, I would, you know, I, I am very much um, like the mayor, kind of uh, supportive of the interest-based dialogue. Um, and I would just, you know, it, I'm not entirely sure when you're talking about, um, you know, having some autonomy over um, professional um, development and training, whether or not there's an opportunity to still have some conversation with, um, you know, with staff on just how you know, we can build, continue to build compassion and communication and with our community into that training. So um, that would be my hope as we move forward. Okay. Roll call, please. Councillor Emmons. Yes. Councillor Azadi. Yes. Mayor McNally. Yes. Councillor Nermella. Yes. Councillor Seymour. Yes. Councillor Baker. No. And Mayor Pro Tem DeMott. Yes. The motion passes on a 6-1 vote. Thank you again, um, Mr. Conto, for coming tonight. That brings us to 10B. Councillor Seymour. Move to authorize staff to apply for the Colorado Department of Transportation, Transportation Fiscal Year 2025 Federal Highway Safety Improvement Program to request grant funding for two projects, the Sheridan Boulevard and 80th Avenue Intersection Safety Improvement Project and the Citywide Intersection Visibility and Crossing Safety Improvement Project. <laughs> Councillor Inlands, second. It's been moved and seconded to pass um, 10B. Is there any further discussion? Roll call, please. Councillor Azadi. Yes. Mayor McNally. Yes. Councillor Nurmella. Yes. Councillor Seymour. Yes. Councillor Baker. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem DeMott. Yes. And Councillor Emmons. Yes. The motion passes on a 7 0 vote. That brings us to item. 10C1. Councillor Seymour. My colleagues are going to wear me out tonight. <laughs> Move to authorize staff to proceed with the 2022 calendar year purchase of water treatment chemicals through the multiple assembly of procurement officials bid from PVS Technologies in an amount not to exceed $609,817 for ferric chloride. That's your chemical company in the amount not to exceed $84,000 for aluminum chlorohydrate and DPC Industries in the amount not to exceed 249,000 for caustic soda, 54,238 $54, for aluminum hydroxide and $527,104 for sodium hydrochlorate. Councilor Evans, I'm glad that wasn't me. <laughs> Second, it's been moved and seconded to pass uh, 10 C one. Is there any further discussion? Roll call, please. Mayor McNally. Yes. Councillor Nermella. Yes. Councillor Seymour. Yes. Councillor Baker. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem DeMott. Yes. Councillor Evans. Yes. And Councillor Azadi. Yes. The motion passes on a 7 0 vote. That brings us to 10 C two. Councillor Seymour. Move on based on the recommendation of the city manager to determine that the public interest will be best served by authorizing negotiated purchases from the sole source providers as follows. That's your chemical company in the amount not to exceed 112750 for sodium hypochlorite. Mississippi Lime Company in the amount not to exceed $211,800 for lime. Harcos Chemicals in the amount not to exceed $80,600 for sodium permagranate. Perm permagranate. Thank you plus citric acid, I can pronounce that one, and SNF polydine in the amount not to exceed $319,976,000 for polymers. Second. It's been moved and seconded to pass uh, 10C2. Is there any further discussion? Roll call, please. Councillor Nermella. Yes. Councillor Seymour. Yes. Councillor Baker. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem DeMott. Yes. Councillor Emmons. Yes. Councillor Azadi. Yes. And Mayor McNally. Yes. The motion passes on a 7 0 vote. That brings us to item 10 C3. Councillor Seymour. Move to authorize the purchase of these treatment chemicals from other sources should the specific vendor listed for each chemical be unable to deliver its specialty product. The total authorized amount of the above water, wastewater, 
reclaimed treatment chemical purchases is not to exceed $2,249,285.50 in 2022. Councilor Emmons. Second. It's been moved and seconded to pass council or to pass item 10 C3. Is there any further discussion? Mr. Baker or Councilor Baker. Really, thank you, Mayor. I would like to note that for $3 million for chemicals, we will be able to treat approximately 21,000 acre feet of water, which uh, is a great bargain in my thing. And those chemicals are one of the major ingredients of the cost of water. And 3 million for 21,000 acre feet or 6.8 million gallons is pretty reasonable. Any other discussion? Roll call, please. Councillor Seymour. Yes. Councillor Baker. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem DeMott. Yes. Councillor Emmons. Yes. Councillor Azadi. Yes. Mayor McNally. Yes. And Councillor Hermela. Yes. The motion passes on a 7 0 vote. That brings us to our old business. Um, A1 is moved to pass Councillor's Bill Number 1. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mayor. I move to pass Councillor Bill Number 1 on second reading to approve the proposed comprehensive plan amendment for Semper Gardens North Parcel. A request to change the land use designation from residential R.35, or I'm sorry, R-35 to residential R-5. This recommendation is based on the finding that the amendment generally meets criteria set forth in section 11-5-21B of the Westminster Municipal Code. Councilor Emmons. Second. It's been moved and seconded to pass Councilor's Bill Number 1. Is there any further discussion? Mayor, uh, Councillor Baker. I have the thank you, Mayor. Uh, I will be voting against this really motion just as I voted in the first hearing of it. Um, I think it is a mistake on the part of the city to do this. I do not think it meets the criteria that it must meet to gain the uh, 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 exceptions that it's asking for. Uh, First of all, there is the matter of uh, the 6.2 acres of public land dedication. Uh, in the meeting, this was, uh, this was uh, touted by the really proponents as the missing link in our trail system. This is not a missing link. This is a dead end. This is a dead end that serves the people who will live in this uh, okay development. There is no benefit to the people of Westminster as a whole. There is great benefit to the people who live in, who live in this development or who will live in it. It's a great boon. But if ever there was a case where we should take cash in lieu of public land, this was it. Because I do not think that, okay, the really developer would have had any other choice but to use this land uh, uh, as an amenity for the people who will live in his neighborhood. That, that's the most logical and best. And uh, we could have either got cash in lieu of it, or we could have had more acres there at the thing. My next reason for thinking this is a bad choice and does not meet our criteria is the parking that'll be for the people who live there. Uh, we're a very powerful council. And when we approve uh, something in a residential neighborhood, it's gonna be there for a long, long time. And I think we are condemning the people who move into these homes, our future fellow neighbors, to a horrible parking situation. I do not think there'll be enough place for everyone to park their cars. And remember the exemption we're giving here is to not have each resident have their two car garage, but a driveway to park two more cars in it. How many of us have walked around our city, everyone on council has, and I've seen lots of two car garages, not full of cars. They're full of something else. 
one of the advantages of living in a single family home is you have space and our future neighbors who will live here won't have that. And they will have to park their cars, extra cars on the street because these are alley loaded lots. So there's no parking in the driveway because you're gonna disturb five of your neighbors if you do. And uh, again, that's terrible. Number three, because of the choices made for water, this uh, development of approximately 200 homes will use as much water as the exact same development of 137 homes. So in a sense, we're adding, what's that? 60 odd homes for no expensive water. But at the same time, when the drought comes, there'll be no way that this development can share part of the burden of a water reduction. Because, because like apartment houses, they will have no choice. All their water is used for hygiene or sanitation or whatever word choice we feel least awkward with. So for all those reasons, I will be voting no on this. I'd love to, uh, discuss this more with my colleagues, but that of course is their choice. Thank you. Councillor Seymour. Um, I will be voting no as I did on the first reading to be consistent in that, uh, looking at a change from R.35 to R5. Um, and I look forward to uh, the ODP review for the uh, particulars. Councillor Emmons. Yes, thank you. Um, I will be in favor of this as what I was in the last vote uh, for in response to uh, the public comment regarding townhomes. Um, I am in a current townhome. Um, that was my first home. And so I still can only lend my experience to uh, townhomes as the community that I currently live in uh, is 65 years and older so they are looking at that as their final home. And so I support this as a first and last home um, for a variety of different levels of homes that we are approving for this project. Uh, regarding uh, parking, thank you, um, Councillor Baker, for uh, bringing that up. I think if we uh, can look to uh, the Wildflower at the Ranch condominiums, um, they have similar parking and they only have one uh, spot for a garage. And yes, you can fill a garage as like a storage unit, right? Um, but to each their own on um, the parking of that. But the way that they set that up um, is alley loaded, um, but it works for the community in not disturbing the neighbors. And so I think that that is something to look to and um, as we go through this project with many checkpoints, I think that that is uh, something particular that we need to be mindful of in, um, in approving because I, I do agree parking um, is a necessity that we need to, to look at. Um, and then water usage, uh, one of the core criteria of me approving this is uh, that we are not increasing um, the water usage for this, these two parcels. Um, 137 homes is the maximum allotment that is for its current use if we're not changing uh, the designation of its use from 3.5 to 5 or 3.5 to 5 and 3.5 to 8. Um, it is not increasing water usage or the allotment for um, the the homes, just the townhomes that we townhomes and the duplexes that we are approving for this. So there was no increase. Um, it was negligible in water. So that is one of the core uh, things that I look at when approving any land use. This is no different. Um, I think that this is um, a, a good project, a good thoughtful project. Um, it has uh, many connections to our uh, open space trails. Um, and that is through the connection through Sheridan uh, intersection underpass. So um, I think that this this um, is something that I'd like to continue to see as we go through these checkpoints, but um, a reason that I will be approving it tonight. Anyone else? Roll call, please. 
Councillor Baker. No. Mayor Pro Tem DeMont. Yes. Councillor Emmons. Yes. Councillor Azadi. Yes. Mayor McNally. Yes. Councillor Nirmella. Yes. And Councillor Seymour. No. The motion passes on a 5-2 vote. That brings us to Councillor's Bill Number 2. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mayor. I move to pass Councillor Bill Number 2 on second reading to approve the proposed comprehensive plan amendment for Semper Gardens Center and South Parcel, a request to change the land use designation from residential R3.5 um, to residential R8. This recommendation is based on a finding that the amendment generally meets criteria set forth in section 11-5-21B of the Westminster Municipal Code. Second. Oh, I'm sorry, Councillor Evans. Second. It's been moved and seconded to pass Councillor's Bill Number Two. Is there any further discussion? Roll call, please. Councillor Baker. Oh. Mayor Pro Tem Demott. Yes. Councillor Emmons. Yes. Councillor Azadi. Yes. Mayor McNally. Yes. Councillor Nirmella. Yes. Councillor Seymour. No. The motion passes on a 5 2 vote. That brings us to Councillor's Bill Number Three. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mayor. I move to pass Councillor Bill Number Three on second reading, amending the zoning of the subject property, a 34.2 acre parcel generally located at the West 104th Avenue and Sheridan Boulevard. This parcel is currently zoned. Is that 01? 01. The owner is seeking to rezone the property to plan unit development. This recommendation is based on a finding that the rezoning is generally supported by the criteria set forth in section 11-5-14 um, of the Westminster Municipal Code. Councillor Emmons. Second. It's been moved and seconded to pass Councillor's Bill number three. Is there any further discussion? Roll call, please. Mayor Pro Tem DeMott. Yes. Councillor Emmons. Yes. Councillor Azadi. Yes. Mayor McNally. Yes. Councillor Nirmella. Yes. Councillor Seymour. Yes. Councillor Baker. No. The motion passes on a 6-1 vote. That brings us to Councillor's Bill Number 4. Um, Councillor Emmons. I move to pass Councillor's Bill Number 4 on second reading annexing into the city the 2.9 six acres of privately owned property that is west of the easterly edge of Lowell Boulevard and north of the West 82nd Avenue alignment. Councillor Nurmela. Second. It's been moved and seconded to pass Councillor's Bill number four. Is there any further discussion? Councillor Baker. Yes. Uh, even though uh, uh, it was unfortunate that uh, we didn't follow the full spirit of our own municipal code. We did follow all the legal requirements. So I will be voting in favor of this. Councillor Emmons. Councillor Baker, could you mm, define how we're not fully committed <laughs> to following our code? Okay, because this was the one, this was, Sorry, this was the one where we thought, I thought, I thought we had to put a sign on every piece of property and we didn't. So we only put a sign on the one piece of property. So when I got the call, we didn't have signs on property. I said, we can't do that. And I later came to find out that eh, this wasn't like others. And yes, we did follow all the rules and like with the notice of really publication. We didn't publish it in the local paper. That was the expectations of the people who live in Westminster. Uh, I wish we had done a better job on that. But uh, we're already committed to this project and to vote against it would just be holding things up and obstructing it for no useful purpose. And I won't do that. Roll call, please. Councillor Emmons. Yes. Councillor Azadi. No. Mayor McNally. Yes. Councillor Nurmella. Yes. Councillor Seymour. Yes. Councillor Baker. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem DeMott. Yes. The motion passes on a 6-1 vote. 
That brings us to Councillor's Bill number five. Councillor Emmons. Uh, Okay, move to pass Councillor's Bill number five on second reading, annexing into the city the 1.481 acres of public right of way of West, West 84th Avenue between East Edge of the Lowell Boulevard right of way and Easterly to the center line of Irving Street. Councillor Numella? Second. It's been moved and seconded to pass Councillor's Bill number four. Is, uh, five, sorry, five. Is there any further discussion? Roll call, please. Councillor Azadi. No. Mayor McNally. Yes. Councillor Nermella. Yes. Councillor Seymour. Yes. Councillor Baker. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem DeMott. Yes. And Councillor Emmons. Yes. The motion passes on a 6 1 vote. That brings us to Councillor's Bill number six, Councillor Emmons. Move to pass Councillor's Bill number six on second reading, annexing into the city the 3.587 acres of public right of way of West 88th Avenue between the center line of Lowell Boulevard, East 2,231.64 feet to near Grove Street. Councillor Namella. Second. It's been moved and seconded to, to pass Councillor's Bill number six. Is there any further discussion? Roll call, please. Mayor McNally. Yes. Councillor Namella. Yes. Councillor Seymour. Yes. Councillor Baker. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem DeMott. Yes. Councillor Emmons. Yes. And Councillor Azadi. No. The motion passes on a 6 1 vote. That brings us to Councillor's Bill number seven, Councillor Emmons. I move to pass Councillor's Bill number seven on second reading, approving a comprehensive plan amendment for the portion of the 2.96 acres of privately owned property that is bounded by the Mead Street center line, the Southern the right of way boundary for West 82nd Avenue and Westerly right of way boundary for Lowell Boulevard and the 1911 Souther Southerly boundary of the original city of Westminster. This recommendation is based on the finding that the amendment is generally supported by the criteria set forth in section 11-5-21 of the Westminster Municipal Code. Councillor Namella. Second. It's been moved and seconded to uh, pass Councillor's Bill number seven. Is there any further discussion? Roll call, please. Councillor Nermella. Yes. Councillor Seymour. Yes. Councillor Baker. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem DeMott. Yes. Councillor Emmons. Yes. Councillor Azadi. No. Mayor McNally. Yes. The motion passes on a 6 1 vote. That brings us to Councillor's Bill number eight. Councillor Emmons. I move to pass Councillor's Bill number eight on second reading to establish the zoning as City of Westminster planned unit development for the portion of the 2.96 acres of privately owned property, property that is bounded by the Mead Street center line, the southerly right of way boundary for the 82nd Avenue, the westerly right of way boundary for Lowell Boulevard, and the 1911 southerly boundary of the original City of Westminster. This recommendation is based on the finding that the amendment is supported by the criteria set forth in sections 11-4-3, 11-5-2, and 11-5-3 of the Westminster Municipal Code. Councillor Namella? Yes. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> One lady. Uh, second. It's been moved and seconded to pass Councillor's Bill number eight. Is there any further discussion? Roll call, please. Councillor Seymour. Yes. Councillor Baker. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem DeMont. Yes. Councillor Emmons. Yes. Councillor Azadi. No. Mayor McNally. Yes. And Councillor Nermella. Yes. The motion passes on a 6 1 vote. That brings us to, count, uh, to move, uh, ah, Councillor's Bill number nine. Mayor Pro Tem. Councilor's Bill number nine, Mayor Pro Tem. I move to pass Council Bill number nine on second reading, amending the effective date section of ordinance number 4018, series 2020, or series of 2020. Councilor Emmons. Second. It's been moved and seconded to pass Councilor's Bill number nine. Um, is there any further discussion? Councilor Namella. Did we, this, um, 
Did we mention we were going to have public comment on this? On the, just like in regular public comment, not in the hearing. Okay. Um, roll call, please. Oh, wait, who seconded? I didn't get, did you second? Okay. It's been moved and seconded to pass Councillor's Bill number nine. Roll call, please. Councillor Baker. No. Mayor Pro Tem DeMott. Yes. Councillor Emmons. Yes. Councillor Azadi. No. Mayor McNally. Yes. Councillor Nirmella. Yes. And Councillor Seymour. Yes. The motion passes on a 5-2 vote. Uh, that brings us to Councillor's Bill Number Ten, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mayor. I move to pass Councillor Bill Number Ten on second reading, amending the effective date section of the Ordinance Number Forty Nineteen, Series of Twenty Twenty. Councillor Emmons, second. It's been moved and seconded to pass Councillor's Bill Number Ten. Is there any further discussion? Roll call, please. Mayor Pro Tem Demott. Yes. Councillor Emmons. Yes. Councillor Azadi. No. Mayor McNally. Yes. Councillor Nermella. Yes. Councillor Seymour. Yes. Counts and Councillor Baker. No. The motion passes on a 5-2 vote. That brings us to Councillor's Bill Number 11, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mayor. Move to pass Councillor Bill Number 11 on second reading, amending the effective date section of Ordinance Number 4020 in Series of 2020. Mayor Pro, or Councillor Evans. <laughs> Second. It's been moved and seconded to pass Councillor's Bill Number 11. Is there any further discussion? Roll call, please. Councillor Emmons. Uh, yes. Councillor Azadi. No. Mayor McNally. Yes. Councillor Nirmella. Yes. Councillor Seymour. Yes. Councillor Baker. No. Mayor Pro Tem DeMott. Yes. The motion passes on a 5 2 vote. That is, concludes all the business before City Council. It is now 8.36 and the City Council meeting is adjourned. We will now move to our WIDA board meeting, incorporating the roll call from the past meeting. And do we have a motion to approve the minutes of January 24th? Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move to approve the minutes of the January 24th, 2022 meeting as presented. Councillor Emmons. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of January 24th, 2022. Is there any further discussion? Count. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. That brings us to um, move to remove, move to remove the from the table, resolution 217 for consideration by the Westminster Economic Development Authority. Councillor Emmons. I move to remove the table resolution number 217 for consideration by the Westminster Economic Development Authority. Mayor Pro Tem. Second. It's been moved and seconded to um, remove from the table resolution number 217 for consideration by the Westminster Economic Development Authority. Is there any further discussion? Um, roll call vote, please. Board Member Baker. Yes. Uh, Vice Chair DeMott. Yes. Board Member Emmons. Yes. Board Member Azadi. Yes. Chairperson McNally. Yes. Board Member Nirmella. Yes. And Board Member Seymour. Yes. The motion passes on a 7-0 vote. Councillor Emmons, would you like to move to adopt resolution 217? Yes, thank you, Chair. I move to adopt resolution number 217, authorizing the interim executive director to execute a purchase and sale agreement for the portion of lot two, block 1A, and part of tract E in downtown Westminster with 4775 holdings LLC in substantially the same form as presented. Mayor Pro Tem. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adopt Resolution 217. Discussion? Councillor Baker. Thank you. Uh, really, thank you, Chair. I mean, uh, Board Member Baker, sorry. <laughs> uh, I think this is a very bad proposal. Um, 
First of all, this is going to profoundly change what has been done at the current downtown. At the current downtown, there is only one single story building and no one would know it by looking because it has okay facades that go three stories, maybe higher into the air. So why are we now abandoning all the work that has been done over the last several years and going with this new uh, archetype, with this new role model? I don't understand to that. I think it diminishes what we've done there. I think it damages what we've done there. Now, I'm not against change. I've advocated for change more than once. But you need to take a moment before you make the change and think about what it is. And uh, the information presented to us in the packet, I don't feel fits that bill. I don't think it's made the case for this change. I mean, right up, and this isn't to uh, denigrate or really minimize the advantages of this project would do. Because right now that part of the city, except for the Costco, is a food desert. You know, and having a place that sells food to the people Just who a live. Second. Those um, talking in the audience, please, um, so that we can hear. Thank you. Uh, and uh, except for the Costco, this is a food desert, and this would be a resource for all of our neighbors who live downtown where they could shop for food and do those kinds of things. Uh, so not minimizing any of that benefit, because there is great benefit there. But it comes at a very large cost. And the first cost is the price. In our own reference material, we say that we feel the property is worth a million dollars. But we're going to sell it for half a million dollars? Uh, in my language, that's a subsidy. We're giving this purchaser uh, a $500,000 subsidy. And there's no kinder way to say that that I'm aware of. And, uh, the value for this subsidy is we'll get a grocery store there. Uh, right now, there's something like 15, 19,000 square feet of rentable first floor space right in the center of downtown. Boy, that could, I don't, I think that could serve as a wonderful grocery store location. Now, we were told in our briefings that that's not the paradigm of grocers in, in the Denver market which I certainly see that. I used to work for a grocer in the Denver market and he liked to own his property. But I think if you go to other cities, their really grocers don't have any problem with running their operations out of a rental place. And weren't we modeling the new downtown off of other cities? At least that's what I thought we were doing. Uh, my next... Uh, discomfort with this is there seems to be uh, a relationship between our paid consultant and the purchaser as if she's serving both sides of the transaction because uh, this purchaser actually was involved in a transaction in the new downtown something like six years ago. Now that didn't, uh, that didn't consummate for reasons that I do not know, but it shows the relationship or what I see as the relationship between this purchaser and our consultant. And I think that's a very bad thing. And uh, for those reasons, I'm going to be voting against the sale. I think it's a bad sale. Thank you. Board Member Seymour. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, um, I'll be voting in favor of this. It, it is unique property. It is a unique segment of land. We're still going to get the benefits of, I believe, Block A1, which is next to it, or Block 
it, this is a portion of block A1. Um, it, it being a one story here is unique in that area. Um, it is um, a, a specific use uh, for this grocer to come into. And I, I look at this also is that it gives us a, a unique uh, carve out on that block A1 being one story, it, it allows a view quarter, um, if you may, into the downtown area. So um, instead of having something butted right up next to that, um, I, I think it'll be, bring considerable uh, benefits. And if we look at um, a reasonable sales tax return on this and projected sales that the um, have, have been brought to us, um, I, I think it'll be um, a good turnaround for the city and its residents from a cost standpoint, and then also a benefit to those people in the area. Councilor Numella. Did you want to go? I'm sorry, at my screen, just for IT's notification, it says seat six, seat 11, and seat 12. I have no names, so sorry. I can't see who comes first, so oh, yeah, <laughs> sorry. Um, well, I don't claim to be an expert on many things, but I, do have to say I, I know planning well, um, and I know uh, you know Westminster's downtown well. Um, you know when we talk about the downtown uh, as you know it has to be all new, it all has to be all you know, the same. Um, I think there's a special quality to every downtown and every place that we go where there is a level of authenticity, and some of that comes from just reuse of existing buildings and seeing something that's been there for a long time. Um, this building is a really unique opportunity to use something that the city owns already. And it's very, it's a sustainable approach to adaptively reuse and expand this building. And I, um, I think that is, um, a great use for, uh, for the existing, uh, building on the site to have a grocery that brings, um, you know, fresh food to the area. And also just as we think about ourselves as landowners, we're also thinking about fulfilling a very long-term vision and being able to attract additional sales to the site. Um, I think it's very prudent of us to be um, bringing amenities like this to the site, particularly as we look to attract, um, continue to attract office and employers to help generate uh, a strong economy, not only for the downtown area, but for um, the uh, city as a whole. You know, to the point about the price, um, you know, it's, it, I think there was certainly a range provided to us on what the cost of these buildings, uh, existing buildings are throughout the area. And, you know, th those are just fee simple sales. That means it's just being sold over to the next owner and they can do with that property as they please. But this sale comes with strings attached. And I think that warrants a, um, a unique sale price. So I, um, and strings attached include us requiring the owner to run a grocery store for 15 years. Is that right? Um, so I think we're, we're getting something out of that. So in some ways you kind of have to um, look at the whole picture. Um, and then I do want to address the relationship between um, our consultant, who is our sales, our real estate uh, agent for the site, um, and, the, and the property owner. What I have learned about real estate is it's all about relationships. It's building trust. And um, you know, the people that invested in our downtown looked at a patch of dirt and they believed in our city, they believed in the vision, and they invested in the site. And um, so it is all about relationships, and that's a good thing. So um, with that, I'll be voting for this. Mayor Pro Tem. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I am going to be supporting this. I love the uh, um, adaptive reuse, and I actually like the transition of the smaller building. One of the things that I've never really loved about the downtown concept is the density. So um, having a move from uh, something that's been there for a really long time, I, I don't have a problem with. I, I think one of the most um, telling things to me is there is no actual subsidy. I mean, the, you, you, what you're seeing as a subsidy is off of a uh, projected estimate of, of land value. 
Um, one of the things that I've always had a problem with in general of the downtown is we're the ones trying to decide what it's worth. And it's worth what somebody will pay for it. And so if that's what somebody's going to pay for it, that's what the value is. Um, I could think that my car is worth $60,000, but if nobody's going to give me $60,000, it's not worth $60,000. Um, so I, I think that, you know, I'm looking to, we do need a grocer there and I'm looking to somebody who's obviously very uh, um, successful at what they're doing and bringing a neat concept. Um, I do I do hope that at some point, maybe on the other edge of the downtown, they have another grocer that, you know, maybe isn't the same niche market, but I think this is a good adaptive reuse and I am very happy to see this actually come into fruition because I do, to your point, I know they've worked on this relationship for a very long time to um, see this actually happen in the downtown. So I'm excited to support it. Board member Izadi. Thank you, Chair. <laughs> um, just want to echo what most of my colleagues have said. Um, I'm actually in the real estate business. Um, not in Colorado, but uh, I've been in it for many years. And Mayor Pro Tem DeMott nailed it on the head. Real estate is worth what someone would pay for it, period. What we were given the first time was an estimate. Estimates change. This grocer has deep ties in the community. Many, many deep ties, and that's a good thing. Um, great business owner, has other grocery stores, and... To me, what this comes down to is we're, well, we, we are either for the people or we're not. At some point, we have to stop debating the slam dunks like a grocery store, which is needed in a food desert, which is what that area is. And we need to debate the important things that require debate. This does not require debate. This is an obvious decision to me. People need food. People need grocery. Let's just do it. Thank you. Councilor, or board member Emmons. Thank you. Uh, I, you know, I don't have much more to add. Um, I, the key things that I had liked out of this project was that we're retrofitting and recycling a current building. Uh, and then it's a 15 year plan for the area. So I really appreciated that. Um, and then the ability to, to see business, not only there on the corner, but throughout downtown. Um, it's more, I think it's more uh, of an investment than a, uh, I think we originally saw. So I will be for uh, I will be in favor of approving this. For me, it was about the reuse, but also we have right of first refusal. So I think that's critical. And I wish there were more areas where you could look into instead of a, just looking like you only see the first couple of streets of towers and and nothing beyond that. Um, it's sort of daunting to me, but anyway, um, I I, li I like the project. We need, uh, as Board Member Izzati said, we need grocery store down there. Uh, we've got people living there, and we have somebody that sees the bones of what is there and is willing to work with that, build upon it, and um, probably in the eyes of the people living there, it can't come anytime too soon. So. There's nothing more. Roll call, please. Vice Chair DeMott. Yes. Uh, Board Member Evans. Yes. Board Member Azadi. Yes. Chairperson McNally. Yes. Uh, Board Member Nirmala. Yes. Board Member Seymour. Yes. And Board Member Baker. No. The motion passes on a 6-1 vote. And there is no other business before us for the WIDA board. So it is 8.52. This meeting is adjourned. Our next meeting um, is a post meeting and we'll be meeting in this room. But let me ask, <clears throat> I don't know how many people feel comfortable going into a smaller room. Does, is it going to be shown out here if they want to sit out here? I don't know how that works. I'm just asking. We, we do have the capability to audio and video stream from the boardroom. Let me just check to see that it is coming up on these screens. It, it, will, it, is, it is supposed to be coming up on these screens as well. Okay. So I just, because we can leave the doors open because that can be shut off now, right? The, that microphone. We will test that. Uh, okay. Earlier, I, we, we were having <laughs> feedback problems when those doors were open. Okay. Yeah. I don't think it's that mic. I think it creates feedback. That's oh. why we have to shut those doors. Okay. Um, so the, 
but I would announce to anybody in the audience here physically that you are welcome to come into the room with us. Right. It is a full public meeting. And if you're not comfortable doing that, then you can uh, watch it on these screens and hear the audio. Right. And if we have to close the doors and something goes haywire, please just peek your head in and let somebody know something's not working. This is all new tonight. So um, don't be afraid. Come tell us what's happening out here. We, we don't know. And um, we'll take a five or 10 minute break while we get everything set up.
have that basic information. So the I have not just turn on the volume out there? I have to turn it all the way down to zero. Perfect. Even though so we had no test, options. test, test, test. Are we having an issue back out there? Or so I don't know if we lower the volume that we can actually Well, don't say that because I have that so ingrained in my head. Yes.
again? Yes. Oh, we're testing. Test, test, test. Can you hear us? Let's see. I can hear it. Do we have anybody left out there? Everybody's in. Okay, we can turn that now. Yep. Yeah, I'm sorry. I had my uh, muted. Thank you. Turn the heat down. Okay. No. Yeah, yeah no. good idea. What are you? Are you? I've been. Yeah, <laughs> I'm right. I was minus right. twenty, and that was a little heat up in your vest. It's just perfect. Oh, it's just like one. So, so Jody, let's make sure I'm not causing any problems. Is it open? Hi. 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 Well, they must have it. It's about to turn. <laughs> Push the crocodile. Did you ask him? Is it local? <laughs> Do you want to tell us something we don't know about? There's, there's, there's hot water in the Highline Canal now, and there's a crocodile. You should get calamari, but even try this. like chicken. That's actually what he said. We did our Valentine's Saturday night. Last night, we did the prime rib that I got. For half price of half price um, after Christmas, and so that was delicious. That was for the So tonight, yeah, well, Larry was on the phone. There's a bag of coffee. If it's not too late, that is my Our world. Maybe she's trying that one. I can only have one. <laughs> it's the same thing. If I, would, I don't do it, I'm going to measure it. I'm going to measure it. I'm going to sit. And then I wind it now. So I have to have to wind it. I'm surprised that I kind of have to have to wind it. Okay. We're just dialing it in. It's out here. Oh, as I'm talking about it. So, so <laughs> counselor <laughs> Nurmas, which meme do you want? <laughs> so much material. I normally don't, but when I do, actually, I paid for the meme maker that doesn't have the watermark on it because I paid so many. I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna take your five. <laughs> and then you quit making. Yeah. COVID took it. From me. <laughs> the lost years. <laughs> I still can't remember what day it is. Are we live? Yes, we are live. live. I will set the recording. It is 9 13, February 14, 2022, and we are in post meeting briefing. And our two pieces for presentations are rate model workshop and request for direction on the 2022 water and sewer rates. And number two is some for rehabilitation and associated sites evaluation direction. The rest is for information only. So who's starting out? Mayor, thank you. I'll do a few words of introdu introduction and then introduce the team from uh, Public Works and Utilities. Uh, tonight we have um, a rate model uh, that will allow City Council to ask us questions and we'll have uh, real-time feedback on how that um, any changes in the rate model um, affect other elements of the of the way that you the utility is financed and how it affects our ratepayers. So it will be a real time um, exercise, and we will stay here with you as long as we need to to make you feel comfortable. We did uh, want to thank Councillors uh, Baker and Seymour. We uh, tested this uh, on them uh, last Thursday afternoon, and we spent many hours. And with their uh, feedback and help, uh, we've really fine tuned. Um, how the model will be presented tonight um, and, and the kinds of things that you will be able to test with us through that model. So very informal if you're accepting of that of that um, format. 
and we'll go through it together and make sure that we're answering all of your questions. To start with, uh, the two things will happen. Um, I'll introduce the team and you'll get a, a briefing on what you're, what you're seeing up on the screen and then you'll get used to fairly quickly what's changing uh, and, and, uh, and, and why. Um, we will also run three, once we've done that, we'll run three models for you. All three of those models are based on what we uh, call the Baker Seymour proposal. So that will be the rate, uh, the rate changes that have been proposed by um, those, uh, those two councillors. Um, and we'll, we'll modify some other elements and we'll show you how that, how that works. So primarily what we're going to be tinkering with at first um, is um, the annual CIP uh, to show you how that proposal um, can look under a certain condition with an annual CIP allowance that would allow us to maintain the current utility. We'll do that in a second run with a reduced amount for that. Um, and then we'll do a third run where we where we go back to um, an annual amount for the CIP plus add in $100 million uh, to produce a solution for water treatment. That will be a rehabilitation replacement solution. So we'll run those three, those three models for you, all based on what councillors Baker and Seymour have proposed, and we'll show you how those balance out. And the things where you will be wanting to potentially uh, tweak for us will be future um, increases in rates to allow for costs of materials um, um, and labor increases. We'll have those zeroed out at first because you know we want to change as little uh, of the variables as possible. Um, but once you start to get involved, then you'll be able to tell us, run out some uh, some of those and see how that affects the balancing of the utility. And that's addressing some questions that we've heard from some mem members of council about being responsible for the whole utility and the maintenance of it and making sure that we have capital funds to, uh, to do our capital work and also um, ongoing funds to maintain the, the, the quality of the, um, the, the product. So we'll be able to find all, all those for you tonight. Um, and the final thing I would say that um, is also tinkerable uh, for you tonight is debt. And, um, and our team will talk about debt and how that factors into the model and we can do that real time. It sounds like zero to 100 in a couple seconds, but uh, thanks to your colleagues, we, we will be able to run through that with you, I think. And, and I think everyone should be able to get comfortable with this model fairly quickly. I just have a question about the $100 million portion of the scenarios. Um, you said for replacement and refurbishing, is that inclusive is that only semper or is that also an option where we still move forward with a new facility so that's a, that's a good question so in in the model that uh, we'll run but you can run any model with well you can have us run any model tonight but that model run would hold 24 million a year um, in capital um, in the program and allow for 100 million dollars on top of that to uh, produce a uh, replacement facility. It likely would not fund what's currently envisioned as water 2025 at an alternative location. Um, however, we don't have all that information yet. And, and the second item tonight on this agenda is, is, um, is going for affirming my uh, ability to go forward and get that information for you on the Semper uh, alter alternatives. We really don't have a lot yet because we abandoned that um, option very early on in the water 2025 process. And what I would seek to do is without an increase in budget or funds on item number two tonight is, is go ahead and have the existing consultant who knows Semper inside out um, produce for us um, an alternative assessment for Semper. And I would be able to bring that back to you mm -hmm. in, in approximately four months. Um, and that would tell you the next steps, which you would be able to tell hopefully from tonight would be You've got enough money to do that in one of these one or more of these um, sets of model runs you would be able to say no matter what we decide um, in this scenario we could find at least uh, replacement or rehabilitation option under under um, some of these scenarios um, with the the consultant that would move forward with other options um, just so i understand because i i think that it would be beneficial to have as much of flexibility in what they're looking at in the Semper site. Mm -hmm. So will they be looking at the potential of if you had land around there? Because we've talked a lot about that. And there's various scenarios we've talked about, um, but I feel like I'm assuming they could probably come up with some of those suggestions without saying for sure this piece of land or, but being like, placing something near or on top of it. Is that kind of the, the goal of that? Thank you for the question. Uh, the, the short answer will be, we will not limit them to the current footprint of the Semper campus. 
um, and they will be very realistically assessing adjacent parcels, um, whether that's the MSC, although you all saw um, the overhead power lines there are very limiting for us in terms of an immediate use of that corridor beside the, the plant. They will look at, they will not be limited to the, the current campus size. They will look at the other alternatives for us and bring that back into the assessment that they do. So we will know, we will have a SEMPER only solution that will not um, go beyond the SEMPER um, um, boundaries of the current campus. And, and that will be obviously a rehab rehabilitation scenario, right? That will not run us out a hundred years on this utility. It will run us out into a lesser period of time when that plant can keep, can keep going. Um, but there will be another alternative uh, likely presented where we would add some land to that campus somehow. And that would be another scenario entirely. Did any of us ask for keeping it only on the Semper campus? I thought the four alternatives we gave you were using other land. None of them use Semper, did they? So I, I think we can do that that anyway, Councillor, because again, the consultant will will know Semper inside out and we will be able to, you could view that as a as a baseline perhaps, right? Which is a current campus only with no land acquisition or, or um, or use of ex of other lands that we have. But but to be fair, I I have I've certainly asked if you if you ripped and replaced in, in place, and I know that we've talked a lot about constraints of that because of how long that would take versus you know the the months of the year that we don't have capacity. So I have I have asked for something around the, those um, guidelines. So I don't think that that's out of line to be part of the conversation. Okay, like if somebody asked for it. No, I definitely have asked for that. So I think what we could, what, what the way you could look at it is in, in a little over four months, you would have uh, all of your options bookended for you. You would have a, you would have a situation where you took Semper and you rehabilitated it all the way out to uh, a brand new site with a, with a replacement facility, which is, which is the current form of water 2025. And then you'd have some alternatives in between. I don't think we have four months. Well, we already have lowered water rates, so I don't... No, no, that. it's not about the lower water rates. It's about a current legal process undergoing. And do we want to do something different than that? And that's and that's something we need an answer to in six weeks, isn't it? I, I mean, I speak to that point. The, the, the timeline that we present tonight... Um, does not exclude any other options that we would have. It, it, so there would be no uh, options ruled out um, in the four month timeline. Can I, can I just ask as you're um, bringing in the scenarios that you're at, kind of adding to what we've looked at, if you can compare them against what we've already analyzed, I'm assuming there's other sites we already looked at, and just maybe just bringing them forward again and packaging them with the um the site analysis that you're doing for semper so yes. that we could because i think you know for me what i didn't see in the analysis for the uh and the scope of the study was kind of like a, a timing gauge like you know how far can we kick the can down the road like i would love to kick it all the way down 100 years um but so how far does this get us in terms of needing to reinvest to the same or significant scale is, is it you know is it bias 25 years 50 years 100 yes so if i understand the question the information we'll bring back we'll put it all together so that you can look at it all together in in, in relative terms because we already know the 2025 solution um, set us up with a replacement facility that was also feasible to expand into the future so that was that long-term future-proofed uh, approach we're now going to add in some options for you at the other end of that spectrum. So you have the full range that you can look at with the imp with the associated information that you've been asking for. But I, I want to just be very clear about something though, because I, in no offense to your comments, I detest the kicking the can because nobody has asked to kick the can. What we've asked for is alternative solutions that keep the water system going. And so, um, and that's why for me, my part, I've never said 100% no on the water 2025. I want alternative solutions because I think that we all would agree that um, keeping up 
A, our legal obligation, but B, in a way that we are doing more than the bare minimum that we're required to do, I think is something that we all would be on board with. So I, I that's the way that I'm wanting us to approach this is alternative solutions. Um, and one thing I wanted to ask about as far as like alternative sites, um, when we look at that too, I, I would like a level setting on that. When you guys looked at alternative sites, those didn't all go all the way through the process, right? I mean, there was a very limited amount of those that made it to even to the, the resident group or, or stakeholder group. I know that you were in that, but it wasn't it wasn't that big, huge variety that they said they started with, correct? Well, the residential group, and I think there's been some, some um, misinformation on that. The resident group that I was part of through the chamber talked about what a site would look like and how it would affect the surrounding community. How does a water treatment plant, you know, uh, noise, smells, you know, how do we want it to blend in with our surrounding? Um, you know, make it make it similar, uh, uh, make sure you have berms and sight lines that are reasonable. So um, like many of the residents on the north side of town don't even know that Northwest is there. I mean, it's, the, that's really what the residents, we did not get site specific. That was a parallel group that was the experts on that side. We were more concerned about, hey, let's make this uh, a good neighbor. So. Makes sense. But I guess to my point, I, I have heard that from, from people who are part of one or multiple of those groups. So I just want to make sure that we understand our options since I mean, we're being asked to make some decisions that have heavy weight on our community. And so I think uh, Councilor Numel is right in wanting to see as much of the data as we can see as we go down this path. Yeah. Um, one so, sorry, you go. Just on that one point, sorry. Uh, the, yeah, I mean, I'm just wondering if it's like, are all sites kind of similar? I mean, it's, just, it's a new facility on a site. Yes, there's probably going to be some change in dollars on what it costs to buy it, but that's kind of nominal in comparison to the long-term view, just so that we can have a view of what it takes to be outside of Semper. You mean not immediately outside, and not an adjacent parcel, say, but... Non-Semper site. Yeah. No, they're very different. So okay. there's very different situations with elevation um, and distance. Um, and yeah. so okay. the, the final two um, on the Water 2025 location, they were very different sites. One was actually in our open space. And, um, and it, but it was at a very different location and, and um, elevation. Um, I would say, I just want to make sure that we don't leave a concern of, of a counselor, um, you know, on, on, on clarified. We would not allow an option to get ruled out uh, by timeline. We would bring that back to you beforehand. So if we did not finish this work, when another option was coming to a decision point, we'd bring that option back to you. You would not be left out on any on anything in this scenario in terms of you wouldn't have something automatically ruled out um, unless you decided to have it ruled out or Four not. months, I think, rules out all other top options. Well, four months I find completely unacceptable. We have to make a decision, don't we? Not in four months. No, I'm uncomfortable, uncomfortable having that yeah, conversation. I, I feel like there's, uh, if we're to have parts of that conversation, it has to be in the executive session. Before we move forward, could you two, I've called you my boys when anybody's been asking. I said, well, the boys are working on stuff. And we get negative stuff because public doesn't understand. So just share, you came together, you had the time, you started the process instead of having seven of us at a table, which it would take, we would still be clear back probably at your second meeting. If all of us were involved, it's just moved quicker. Um, you've kept us abreast. Um, we haven't worked in in isolation of anybody. So just explain your process so that we get everybody up to speed and then we'll start getting into the delta. Can I throw a quick caveat? And that is that we as a body in our December 4th meeting, when we sat down all together, it came up in that session of if you two should look at it as far as um, aside from all of council um, and the majority of us had agreed that you should take it forward and keep us apprised of that information. So it was a, a council decision 
it wasn't a Baker Seymour. You, you off on your on your own or anything? Oh. I just want the public since the this, this is being recorded. We just need to clarify and get everything on the table that's correct, not misinformation. Well, like a task force. Well, and and we very much appreciate that too. And when you're when we get into staff. Um, um, and Councillor Baker, correct me if I'm off base on any of these. We, we needed to find a, a, a starting place so that we could then come into work like this. And when when you get walked through this spreadsheet, I, I think it's going to far exceed our expectations when we saw this thing, because we can go in here and we can make changes and those can be projected because we've had questions. Well, why did we only do this? And why did we only do that? Because that was just some of the scenarios we sat down and spent three and a half, four hours on the other day was we were just working on some of the assumptions. Okay, is this a reasonable assumption for increasing cost in a utility? And so that's how some of those are plugged in. But but the the value of this is okay, let's let's get a starting point and then also then you know have a discussion on things that um, you know where do we have to you know where can we draw the line on certain things we had and and that the wastewater um, utility is is in a much more precarious situation than the water utility, and so we even said, okay, let's you know we can we can back off that. Let's just leave that as it is and concentrate on the water. And then Councillor Baker came up with the dollars because that's his forte, and say, all right, let's plug these in here and start there and see what it does to us over time on CIP, what it looks like on uh, to the um, debt service, make sure that we've got money so that we can keep our bonding, that we've got to have enough money in, in that. And you will see all of this on here. Um, uh, I'm glad we had a drawdown screen because I'm sure there was finger marks all over that thing when I'm done. I won't, I won't be sticking my finger on this one. We need a big laser pointer or something. <laughs> but we were able to say, okay, let's change this. What if we do this? And that's what the great benefit of this It's Fabulous. Now we started with our first assumptions that they plugged in for us, and then we can run scenarios on that. Um, you know, and and we can make those changes. I mean, we could do this ad nauseum all night long. You know, what, what's a penny here and a penny there, and what's it do five years from now? But we had to start with an assumption, say, okay, let's start with this. Let's leave sewer and wastewater as it is, and then what are we going to do with the, the the rates on this? So. Um, and, and it's it's a marvelous tool to use. So it's just a tool. It's another tool so we can play with those numbers. Okay, and I think the first place to begin is to recognize that we run a very profitable water enterprise. Okay. Especially when you compare the enterprise to what was done in like 2016 and 2017. Okay, uh, or 2015. If then the uh, contentious term of uh, profit versus operating income comes to full view. If you go back to those years, 2015, okay, we were making an operating income, or in my language, a profit of six and a half million dollars. And there really wasn't a lot of problem with that. No one was talking about chaos in the CIP plan or anything else like that. For the See, because in so many of these things, we are making judgment calls. We're making assumptions. And then we put in the numbers uh, and see what those look like. So there's a lot of subjectivity and judgment involved in all of these things. And in 2015, I mean, an operating income of six and a half million dollars was thought to be wonderful. In 2020, we made an operating income of $22 million. So uh, when really Rich and I talked about how to do this, we sort of began there and said, do we really need to make an operating income of $22 million. And we both said no. Is that we could operate this city prudently, reliably, dependably 
on much less than that. Okay, and that we can give up some of that profit. And I think in the uh, calculations that we did here, uh, what did we finally end up with? Something like fifteen million dollars of operating income. You remember? I don't recall that specific. Okay. The model. Could that, you yeah. could you we, really we plug it in and find out how much operating income we would make? Or, so, Councillor Baker, my question here would be: How is that your call, my call? Because I'm one of the councillors. No, we need to use fact-based, expert-based. Councillor Ozadi, and that's why we're here tonight, so that so that we can plug in the numbers and people can see the effect on on our system. <laughs> It, there is no there has been no decisions made. There's options that we have to start someplace. We can't all just pick a number and have each one of our numbers. So that's why we have this. Okay, well, let's start with assumption one, and then we can run the scenario. Well, what, what was the justification for the twenty two? Twenty two million. From the staff. I don't know. You'd have to talk to the city. It's in the budget. What was the justification for having that access? Well, I think I could speak to that. Um, and we covered a little of this. Thank you. Uh, all of the operating income surplus, however you want to call it, is used for capital. It's all spent on capital. It's all accounted for in capital. Less was spent in capital in the past, is the fact of the matter. I'm reading the financial statement has $22 million in operating income, but on a different page, it has $42 million in capital expenditures. So I think we could probably agree that, yes, there's the operating salaries and chemicals and electricity that goes into producing the water. There's rate revenue collected as Mr. Donahue will walk through for you here in a minute. And then there is money left over. Uh, all of that is used on capital. Uh, it can be described as profit, operating income, change in net position. But the numbers are here in the financial statement. We could talk about those, but at the end of the day, all the money is accounted for and it's either spent on operations of the utility or on capital and more money has been spent on capital since. So would it be fair to say that comparing 6 million to 22 million doesn't make any sense because we didn't, we had less capital expenses at the time and now we have more, so we need more. And it's still not covering, the 22 still is not covering what we actually need to invest. Mr. Donahue will walk through that for you on a year by year basis as to what's being budgeted for uh, capital expenditures and it's onward of 20 to 25 million. Of course, we do pay as you go. Some years more money is spent, other years less. So it's not profit. So let's stop calling it profit. Why are you so adverse to the word profit? Because it's not profit. That's why. <laughs> See, I, like I completely numbers. disagree with you. And I think you don't want to call it profit because you don't want to recognize what it truly is. Because profit has all these negative connotations attached to it. No, it and so that if we recognize it as profit and we're a non-profit business, people would say, why are we making so much profit? It's not profit. It's understanding financial statements and knowing that operating income for a city. Let me give profit. you a very tangible example of how we spent CIP in a uh, absolutely reckless manner. Okay, in 2016, we purchased a 20 what ended up being a $23 million biosolids dewatering plant. There was absolutely no need for it, no call for it. It wasn't done to meet some federal requirement. It was done because we liked it and we could save $200,000 a year in basically, I mean, the, I mean, the trucking expense out to our farm in like of the Strasbourg. Can I pause you there for a second? Sure. Was that done because we liked it or was there an actual reason? Because I think we're operating off of assumptions based off our feelings, and we need to stop doing that. Let's let's operate off of actual facts of what happened. We can certainly, I think we have the staff here to talk about the biosolids dewatering program. Julie, are you able to give us an executive overview of that, that project? Yes. Okay, thank, thank you. you. That project did save money on trucking. How much? Well, you said 200000 yep. so let's go with that. Okay. More importantly, the city owns and operates the Strasburg Natural Resource Farm and another one called Comanche Farm. And then there's some land that we lease. Changing the way we do biosolids to reduce the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus with 
the biosolids dewatering building process extends the life and productivity of the farm fields. Of the what? Farm fields. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So there's a long-term gain for the solids dewatering building that extends beyond trucking costs. We're hauling less water. Water is expensive to haul. We haul less. That's my high level summary. So there are economic and efficiency gains from doing that. Uh, and there were also alternative ways that we uh, took, okay, the more really liquid before bio, uh, really biosolids up. Did we have a place up in like Northern Colorado where we take it if like the fields were too wet? Possibly. There's contract hauling available at a price. Maybe we could focus on, on running the financial model. And if you would like to talk about the solids dewatering building, we can answer questions okay, later. Well, no, what I was bringing it up for was, is I think that was a foolish expenditure of CIP. Without getting into that kind of thing, because I don't think it's productive, okay. it can, let's work on the premise that we'd like to figure out how to operate a solid utility at the most reasonable cost possible. I mean, the reality of the things that you're talking about and the increases, I've been here through these increases. Increases were pushed by 2025. That's why I want to see what the alternative is. I think that there is a, a uh, I mean, we could raise these rates, you know, so that we had 40 million extra a year, 50 million extra a year, but can the residents afford that? The answer to that question, I think it was very clear the residents said no in this last election. So the question is, how much can they afford? And with that money, with what they can afford, what can we actually build? And I think that's what we're trying to do here tonight, correct? Yes. I, I feel like it's going a little backwards because when I originally thought when we were going to be rethinking our water approach, I thought that, and the reason why I actually agreed to pause what we were doing was because I thought we were going to go through a process of identifying what do we act, what do we need? What are the alternatives to, you know, the water 2025 plan that we had that correspond to lower water rates and that we were going to find the outcome that we need and, and can afford in balance with the outcome for the residents, which was slightly reduced water rates. Now, and then on top of that, factor in uh, how we would potentially pay for this and some, you know, if, if there was some other creative use of ARPA funds or I don't know, selling trees, whatever. But I, you know, I thought that's the process we were going to go through. And I, I have a hard time with this because it just seems like all night we can play with scenarios, but we don't know what our end game is. We don't know what we're searching for. What are we, what is it? What, we don't know our water 2025 yet. Our, what, I'm sorry, okay, counselor, no, please. So what I have been explaining to those that have been reaching out is that there are 15, 20 moving pieces to this, right? Um, one is water rates. And I understand that you're linking the outcomes to water rates. If we're, what's the goalpost that we're trying to meet? So. For me, looking at this water rate, for me and understanding this and understanding the numbers means what are we currently, not think of any other variable. What do we currently have? We have $4 billion worth of investment in our water system right now, okay? So what do we need to operate that as it currently sits? We need X, Y, Z. Okay, so that's a baseline number. Well, then at what point then we can't just be operating on that, that baseline. We need a little buffer. We need profit because we need to understand then that profit goes to a capital improvement project or projects for replacement or whatever it needs to, to go to. Mm -hmm. And so as a business sense, you're looking at your baseline, putting a little buffer into it so that your, your variables are meeting the economic vitality of your business, which is the water enterprise. 
And so that to me is one, all of that combined is one aspect. In the meantime, that doesn't mean that we're not looking at water 2025 or we're not looking at what we could do with Semper or what we could do with Northwest. Like that is a, a decision now that we can continue to build upon that we could change six months down the road. I wouldn't want to go that way, but that we are focusing on now, but we are then moving the pieces that we need to, to figure out a greater long-term solution that meets the needs of our residents now and in the future. That's so how I see it. I That helps to see. Uh, so tonight it's like the best we can do in my mind is like, we have a baseline because we don't have the buffer. In. We don't have, we don't know how big that buffer should be because we still have that that piece of what in hell are we doing? Sure. Um, so, okay, baseline can be determined tonight, but uh, yeah, I don't feel like that is enough for us to make a decision on rates. So I feel like we should maybe run through the model, run through the numbers. And then if we have greater bots, which I'm sure we will, then we can then dive into what those numbers mean and where we need to feel like we need to go. So I I, I like this is this work has been done. I'd like to to honor staff's time and, and kind of work through that and understand how we got to the numbers. Cause part partly is if I and 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 some may have seen it as stalling, right? As us moving the needle on a water rate approval. However, I see it as if someone asked me, how did you get those numbers for tier one, tier two, tier three? I don't come back to them and say, I don't know, it was just chosen, right? Yeah. This is now a, an example for me to say, we had a study session on this. It made sense because of this variable and this variable and this variable. And now that we have the same information that they worked on, I'm not looking for three, four hours of time. Um, that was the work that y'all, hard work that you guys did. But just understanding like, what does that plug and play of that variable mean? Because there are 15, 20, maybe more different variables that could change to fluctuate that number. And it is subjective then when it comes to the cents and dollars, because once you have a baseline, do you pick and two cents? and 52 cents or whatever it is you're you're working off your then objective numbers on your baseline that's just how i would like to continue looking at this and then we can go back and having a further discussion you know okay. let's go go for it all right so I'm going to introduce uh, the team. You already met uh, Julie. She talked about something she wasn't thinking she would talk about tonight. So we're going to reintroduce Julie Kaler um, from our Public Works Utilities team. Uh, Christine Gray, uh, Chris Gray, and Brian Donahue. Um, are, are, they developed this, this form of the model to be interactive with you. So this is uh, something that they put together for you. Um, and then in addition, of course, is Larry Dorr, our Chief Financial Officer. And we're supported in the audience by uh, Chris Lindsay. Um, um, of our uh, policy and budget department, and Mr. John Palmer, who is with us as well, can answer any questions. <laughs> He's ready, right? I think we <laughs> and the rest of you him. are. That, that's his seat, though, so he can. <laughs> Welcome, and thank you for coming with and staying with us tonight as well. And, and I'm worried about the scarf around Larry's neck. Um, <laughs> I don't Let's, want you to. We'll just take. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want Larry to go like this. <laughs> okay, uh, so I think Brian's going to lead us off, and he's going to uh, talk about how the uh, models put together, what you're seeing, walk you down row by row. It is a, it is stretching, and I'll turn it over to Brian at this point. Thanks, Brian. Thank you, Jody, and thank you, Council, for allowing us to present the financial model. Uh, what I'd like to do is really go uh, line by line, describe the models to you. Um, then help you understand how we manipulate the model, uh, and then uh, speak to all the assumptions that we have built for you and the three options that we'll present to you today. So if I may start by uh, drawing your attention to line number eight. Uh, this is our debt service coverage calculation. Uh, this is a ratio of our net revenue over our current debt service obligations. The planning target here uh, is 1.50. So 
So if you look at uh, row nine, if we include tap fees, uh, these ratios are very positive uh, in the water model right now. If I may jump down to row 13, uh, this is where we begin to manipulate the model. Anything that you see captured in yellow is places that we can uh, input different values, uh, play with the model, and then see results below. Uh, this one is very important to you all and to the community because this is where we manipulate rates. Right now we have a baseline of zero uh, from 2022 all the way out to 2040, and that's the planning horizon of this model, the 2040. As we jump down, uh, the next section is very important, uh, our funding and expenditures. You can see in row 16, our rate revenues our projected tap fee revenues. And row 18 is where we have our miscellaneous revenues. This is really how we're manipulating the model uh, to reduce tier revenues and fixed revenues, and also to uh, define any additional revenues uh, when, we, when we think about total funding. As we jump down to 21, this is our CIP program. This is what we have slated uh, uh, from 22 to 2040, our O&M our O&M expenses, and our current debt service obligations. So basically, total funding over total expenditures. As we jump down to row 26, you can see uh, this pattern of red. So when we have uh, this, is really defines our annual surplus and deficit for capital improvement funding. So when our expenditures are higher than our funding, uh, this is the difference. So in this current version of the model in 22, we would need to use $5 million. And you can see that uh, in out years as well. As I scroll further, uh, I'll draw your attention to row 34. This is where we input debt and the need for debt in combination with rates to balance the model. Just one quick question, sorry, Brian. Sure, no problem. Um, on the, if you just scroll up a sure. couple more lines, is the, um, the net loss on just the line 26 maybe, mm -hmm. um, is that cumulative or is that just an annual? Yeah. So yeah, it's annual, and you, you can kind of see if you look at, um, you know, row over row. So if you look at the 53 million in expenditures in 22, let's say, uh, over the 48 million in revenue, you can see the difference here, and that's just basically the calculation. So in 23, that number increases to 11 million, 12 million in 24. It may help to have a cumulative row, row as well as you... I think as I pan through the rest of the model, it might, okay. I think it would make sense to you. But please ask uh, additional questions if it, if it doesn't. So again, um, debt issues. So this is here, uh, this is where we manipulate the model um, as we try to determine the level of debt we need in combination mm -hmm. with rates to balance the model. Uh, the last line I'll show you, and this is really the most important, is the ending balance on 43. Really, this is our capital project reserve. You can see that it flows through the model. Uh, our current balance is 57 million. And as we use or have a, a deficit here, this balance decreases here. So in this particular version of the model, we balance through year 2025. And then if I can pan out to 2040, uh, you can see the red uh, that's associated with the current condition of the model. So that's pretty much how the model's laid out. There's 30 different tabs that contribute to this master control. So a bunch of data behind all this, uh, financial planning, uh, consumption, conservation, a lot of different things are built in uh, but this is really the main kind of driver 
where we can manip manipulate the model. The assumptions behind the capital expenditures, um, is that assuming the current water 2025 plan or? And I can speak to that now. So really, I just wanted to lay out how the model works and flows line by line. Now we can get into the different options if you like. So we have three options to show you and I could speak to CIP um, and the loss of revenue and those type of things if we want to move into that phase. What is the, what are the numbers set at to get these? Is that just, are these baseline? Like how does that, how do you plug and play the tiers? That's in the rate revenue up at the top. Yeah, so row 13, or excuse me, yeah, row uh, 16, that's all of the tiers, commercial, residential, uh, everything is in D16. That's correct. What would that be set at though? Like, is that the numbers that was proposed? I think those are our rates tonight. That's that, that's actual our revenues. Uh, so right now? Right now, right. So tier one and two. Um, that's actually all three tiers. What we do is we manipulate the model to decrease the revenue, and I'll show you that uh, in row 18 here. Right. So once we once I laid it out for you, I was going to speak to the assumptions. Okay. So that might be the next best step, uh, and then you know we could talk up, see if you have any further questions there. So in row 18 right here, I have listed the assumptions. So the full tier one, tier two, tier three reductions, the fixed fee reductions, we figured that to be around. Uh, Six million, so about five point nine million in reduced revenue. Um, with our CIP, what we did was define a ten-year average uh, at twenty-four million. So that's what's built in here right now. You can see that in line twenty-one. So th this option number one, we'll, we'll call option number one, has no dollars built in for uh, for a water plant replacement or otherwise. So what is it? Just replacing long, existing lines and this this is R and I mean R and R. Um, there are CIP projects built in. I mean there are specific defined projects built in, and I could show you those if you like. That could illustrate some of the detail of what goes into that twenty four million a year. Sure. Let me let me show you that. Let's go to that tab. And as Brian pulls that up, so the twenty four million is a ten year average for. Uh, for capital expenditures outside mm -hmm. of water 2025. So not including a replacement uh, water treatment facility. So that gives you a baseline on what what we spend to maintain this utility. And it's a depreciating uh, facility. So how long does that last us? Great question. <laughs> that is a good question. It depends on the on the asset. So Julie can speak more to the long-term planning process, which is how we come up with those specific projects. And these are the specific projects as defined by our engineering team and by Julie. Eventually, so, for $24 million a year until it's defunct. And how long? No, $24 million every year. single year, plus it escalates over time. It's not replacing, so at some point. We've said before that Simpler needs a minimum of $4 million per year in routine R and R to keep it going, no improvements. We've deferred about 15 million. Sorry, Larry. We've deferred about 15 million because we thought we were on the water 2025 path. So there's going to be a hit of 15 million, followed by four and four and four and four. Mm -hmm. High level. So this currently assumes just a tier three. From last, from two no, no this, this actually assumes the whole package of tier one, tier two, tier three reductions, and the fixed fee reduction. Oh, the new. So, so, so if we were to say the initial assumption, the, yeah, the initial assumption, but we can manipulate the model um, to any desired revenue loss. But it's not viable over time. You, so, I well, I, I need this is the kind of information we need because if this is not. Well, let me a show you solution this. that. Let me show you this. I'll show you um, the manager yeah. control again. And so, may I also say that right now, what Brian's doing is showing you how the model works right. and relates. This is not a specific. We're not presenting um, like not recommendations to you. We're showing you um, by changing as few things as, for example, we don't have any um, percentage increases at all. You're probably going to tell us that at some point soon you would want to do that because it does affect 
the redlining of clearly, right? It would it would allow us to uh, keep up with costs of increases and such. So this is not a literal model for you to look at just yet. Brian's really showing you how these pieces connect and where CIP relates to um, uh, debt choices, um, percentage increase choices, um, and our and our overall capital reserve balance. But then we can really get into it and you can say, well, let's get a realistic scenario. Let's put in some percentage increases starting in year 24. Let's put in, um, make sure we put in the $100 million plus the uh, sustained capital program for uh, a replacement option. And let's see what that, we could even run water 2025 in this model for you and show you what a 205 or 210 million facility look, uh, looks like in this model and how that informs. Can we actually do that as, as one of the things we yeah, do tonight? So Because that's really the only thing. For, so for, for me, the only important, there's other important things, but the most important thing here is, are we going to be able to pay for a plant or not? I know, it's isolated to the, yeah, it's, it's, I get what you're saying, counselor, but we cannot, I, it's, it still doesn't make sense to me doing this exercise without knowing how much a plant would cost or what, or where we're going with that. Then we're modeling off of feelings. We need so, to model off of what do we, how, how much do we need to get a plant? Because that is key to our long-term sustainability of the city. So with this baseline model, so Brian's walked through the, the variables that go into it, kind of how it's set up, we can start right in. What kind of rate would you like to assume and in what year? Do you want to start with 4% in 2024? Do you want to start with 4% in 2030? That's the first part of this is let's put in some rates, see what happens to the revenues, see what happens to the shortfall, see what happens to the red, and then we can change things like the CIP. We can bump it up or bump it down. We can add that into the mix. Okay, so where were you guys starting at? Like, you had a, is that? Well, this is based on, then the first thing we did is we agreed that the, you know, right. cost, the rates are in here. This is the just the baseline rates that were proposed on that plan. And then we, we in that meeting said, okay, cost of goods and services always go up. So let's, let's plug that in. And I think we started with a 4%. That's correct. Okay. You know, is that in reality in today or, you know, there was a discussion, what's the price increases in, in a utility versus some of our general inflation start. So then I believe we started 4% in 2023 because that's this next rate year because we're doing the 2022. And so then we straight line those across, those will change, but just throw those in. So put those let's, in and see what happens. Yeah. I, just, I just want to draw your attention again to, to 43. And right now the model, the model balances through 25. Now that we start manipulating it, that should be drawn out further, further in time. And to clarify, what's on the screen has the new proposed rates in it. Tier one at 354, tier two at 554, and tier three at 954. The reduction of revenue is built in. Yes. So is the tier that's three, where is tier three what starting the new proposal. rates would be if we passed it. Yeah, it's in row eight. It's, 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 it's represented in row eighteen. So For you now. can see you can see our miscellaneous revenues at seven point three and twenty one. Right. And in twenty two that number goes down to one point six. So that revenue reduction is built in as defined. Brian, if I could, I don't I want to make sure that the council uh, got a look at the capital improvement plan details there. Absolutely. In particular, I think Mayor Pro Tem was wanting to understand what the rate payer is getting for what they're paying and can they afford that? And if not, what could kind of go on that list? Now, Councilor Baker brought up a, a wastewater project earlier with Ms. Kaler, but there could be other projects on here and you see these now Wattenberg gravel lakes and you see the millions of dollars to the right and Brian can if you could just kind of give some more examples to that, then I think we could close the thread on that, Mayor, for sure. if, that, if that would help. And all of the audience. So, of so everything that's highlighted here is a real project slated for 23 through 27. So the top project that we're looking at, the Lowell Boulevard pipeline replacement. short on screen so let me just, uh, <laughs> let me just hide this a quick. double panorama wrapper let me, let me hide this here and i'll show, give you a better idea um, so little, little boulevard pipeline replacement six million dollars semper major r and r 
Uh, we have built in $13.5 million. Uh, Northwest major R&R, uh, &R, $7.6 million. And these, again, are all real projects as defined by our engineering team. Sorry, there's 2023, so these are actually larger, mm -hmm. larger numbers. And Mr. Andrews, we could go into greater detail with our engineers describing any of these that, that you know, Northridge pump station might not, well, that actually is probably pretty obvious, but, um, you know, maybe perhaps some of the others might be of interest in the necessity, the aging and uh, condition of those particular assets could be useful. But, but for the moment, thank you, Brian, for describing what's in the model and what level of detail the 24 million isn't is is not is specifically connected to actual projects Absolutely. for five years and just these top two projects over three years is going to spend 25 million dollars maybe you could just could you highlight that whole field of view there and let's just get an idea of the subtotal uh, 95 million approximately about 94 million so that's about 20 million a year cip uh it's 24. so you can see the total the total CIP yeah. we have built in at uh, an average of 24. You can see that total here over. You took, uh, like, you took an average of the next five years. We took an average for this purpose uh, over the last 10 years Got it. to provide okay. an average figure for you. Uh, I think our engineering team wanted that number to be uh, larger to actually suspend the decline of the system. And, you wanted to, and if you go to the top of that, segment that you've highlighted in yellow. So there must be, uh, no, go up one more because there's a $15 million. So adding the 15 million of the rest is how you got to the 24. Yes, yes sir. sir. Yep. So if it didn't So add basically up, the 15 is undefined right now. We are in the middle of doing our long-term planning. So for this effort, we have some specific projects, but we're still working on the rest of them. So that 15 is a set of projects that we know we need to do. It's just prioritizing them with the rest of the staff. So we know those in yellow, and then the rest of them that we have to figure out still are highlighted in the future CIP line. Brian, to, I'm just trying to clarify. So when we're talking about like our base needs, $24 million is like gives us a heartbeat, but um, you're talking about like we're still aging significantly. So um, you're saying engineers would- I, I think they believe that number should be higher than 24 million a year. Let me know so I'm speaking you, out of line, but- At 24 million per year with a $4 billion utility. Remember the math that you asked about? How do you get that? We're investing as if our individual parts lasted 200 years. Nothing we own lasts 200 years. Some of our dirt canals will last 100. So 24 million is sort of barely a heartbeat. That's a question. So Baker, um, Councilor Baker and Seymour have said that this proposal, so this is the proposal that has been proposed, right? And they've said that staff is happy with this plan, that staff is in agreement. That was part of the email. Right. Yes. Right. They, they agreed that this this is our starting input. They have not put a rubber stamp on it in any way, shape, or form. But it was said that staff is happy with this plan. They're happy with the planning. I mean that that there's there's been no there's been no agreement. We're okay, still so in conversation. No, so there is no. But we have not left out. You know these are important projects that are going to be funded. If we think we're going to stop the aging of any utility system, I think we live in an alternative world. Everything is aging all the time. And so we need to have numbers like this. And then you'll see too that this is just the baseline. This is the baseline. We haven't, add, we haven't added any growth assumption to our rates. This is if we have rates forever this way. That We agree that that's not a reality of anything. Cost, so cost just, of service goes just, just want to clarify, there is no opinion from staff on this. We are. Maybe I could add for clarification um, to, to what Councillor Seymour was saying and also what Councillor Emmons was saying earlier. Um, Councillor Baker and Seymour did not present um, all of the variables in what, what they presented. In, for example, did not talk about debt, did not talk about 
um, uh, the debt ratio. They did not talk about um, future increases in terms of percentages um, in, in that proposal. So, so what you're seeing here takes the building blocks of what they've suggested, which you can you can tonight tell us that we, you want to change one of those elements and we can model that for you, right? But we had to start, uh, as Councillor Seymour has said a couple of times, we had to start with something. So we chose to start um, at their proposal uh, on rates and fixed fee changes and then modeling that forward, we can change any element of their proposal tonight with you real time, and we can change any of the other uh, dials on here, like future percentage increases, um, debt, which Brian hasn't um, shown, you know, we haven't gotten into the debt uh, loading yet. Um, we could say 24 million, that could be that could be 30 million, that could be 12 million, which we actually ran. So we can change any of these elements, but I just wanna be clear that, that the proposal was not this, Right. This is much more comprehensive than what uh, Councillors Baker and Seymour proposed. So we're showing you how those numbers tie into the fi financial planning for the utility and for the ratepayers, so that you can see how everything interrelates, and then we can start to make some. Yeah, that day that our discussion in this part was Brian running through this real quick, and then we started throwing in assumptions. Okay, let's add this. Let's add this, and then okay, instead of doing water twenty twenty five at this price, what if we did? Can we 100 million and when can we model that in there? So, I mean, we haven't even gotten adding to the rates yet either. Well, they're not stagnant. So, why don't we just add in a percentage increase that seems reasonable and then put in the number of capital improvement that would actually maintain a $4 billion uh, utility and then um, put in a dollar amount? Let's start with a dollar amount, maybe 100 million for the whatever water it is. Uh, well, start with a rate and, and see how this flows through, because then you will get a better feel for how this works. So with councillors Baker and Seymour, we put 4% in. So let's start with that and see what that looks like. And then 2023 start 4%? Uh, mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Let's do it. Watch those red, well, okay, you'll, you'll move it, but watch the red lines, numbers. There we go. Like, how did it? I don't have a full screen, so I have to <laughs> hand down for you. It's a trade off between micro font. <laughs> you, yeah, font you can read from here. The 4% means what? That's two percentage increase or? Each year, yeah. right? On the rate. So raising the rate by 4%. Okay. Yes. okay. The whole rate structure would lift in this model 4% each year. This isn't taking into account consumption, which we know the rates have decreased. Granted, we want to conserve water, but I mean, there is a thought process that some people may use more water. So we, have, we do have conservation built into this. So we have conservation for folks who have older homes and conservation for newer homes. So we do have a decreasing amount of water use built in to this financial model to address just that. Well, and that's good, but I mean, I want to look at that one different way, though, because like I do think that we need to conserve over time. However, the rate of conservancy, I think, is debatable, and we the rate that we saw after the twenty nineteen and eighteen, well, what we did in twenty eighteen, I think, was probably more than what you were seeing in previous years. So there's a thought that people may use more in some of those upper tiers if you know, more affordable. So, and that's always been the balance, right? I remember having this conversation in 2018. It's a two-edged sword. Yeah, you want people to conserve, but at the same time, we have to pay for the infrastructure. And so if you do too much and people don't use it. So, I mean, it, and I guess maybe that's not a, a tangible thing that we can really judge because we don't really know till we make some adjustments what will happen. Would that be fair to say? Yeah, there's. I would offer two comments and the team can, can um, augment augment these. One would be um, with the modeling exercise like this, the most illustrative way to move through it is changing one variable at a time um, so that you can see the actual impact of a rate change um, when you fix the, you know, when you assume that your usage is as presented in the model. We could also also change um, the, you know, the volumes and, and change what we've built in in terms of conservation. However, I would say that much bigger impact on, on our usage is whether it's a drought year or a wet year. Th those are the two things that'll just throw your numbers out way more statistically 
than any of our modeling work around conservation on a you know on a year to year basis. So our recommendation would be to for the purposes of at least tonight um, just to go through the model and not change consumption based on these numbers so not overtly, and then we can monitor that data. But I'll I tell you that's that, fair. I just want to know yeah, how it plays in because I know. I know that's been part of the debate and I want to at least keep it in mind, even if it doesn't. And I think it makes sense what you're saying, not to put it in the model, but at least for us all to understand that there's those variables that we just don't know. Yeah. So by adding the 4% uh, from 2023 through 2040, the model now balances the year 2027. So very impactful. But that's assuming the $24 million CIP annual, which isn't enough. That's that's exactly correct. So this is the, the kind of option with the, the average 10-year CIP of $24 million. So what would be a... Okay. I'm, I'm curious on that because here's this is one of those, in my mind, subjective. Because it depends on what we do with the utility. It depends on what we we do with 2025. It depends on a lot of things. It depends on technology that we just frankly don't, you know, the technology that you're using today, I have to imagine is 10 times better than what we used five to 10 years ago. So, I mean, we're, we're making some assumptions that we just don't, don't know. I mean, I've even heard you guys share with us before, you could put a piece of pipe in the ground, depending on the ground you put it in, that's part of that line might deteriorate in you know half the time that you thought it would and the other part of it might go 10 times as long because there's just some of those things we we don't know so i, I and the reason i bring it up is over time i mean at some point we do have to say here's the number and we got to live in it and i think that that's you know the balance that that i'd like to try to strike that gets us to a place where it's more affordable for people but keeps pushing the curve because i don't like the you were here before. It's not like you weren't doing CIP before. It wasn't like we were like, yeah, we'll see what happens in, in 20 years. I mean, that's not the reality of whatever happened. And I think that's why we're going to have this round table later this, this week is because we want to under get in the heads of the people who were doing this job before and, and see like, what were you thinking was going to happen in 20 years? So I, I think we all have to think about that as we move forward, because I think that this is going to be kind of a, a moving target. And I think that you guys are right that we got to pick something for this next year, see what it does, and we're going to have to reevaluate. I'm, I am for one open to saying let's build in some sort of increase for the the next year, that's a reasonable increase, and then reevaluating like we've always done while we do some of this other planning and figure out what other options do we have. So I'd put that as as a point because at some point, I mean. What did you say? We could look at these numbers in, until Friday, and at some point, we're going to have to... You can have a lot of fun with this thing, <laughs> day and night, if you like I, it. I, this I, gives I, me anxiety. You hiding cells gives me anxiety because <laughs> people do that, and then they want the IT guy to unhide them. I'm like, I'm not an Excel guy. I can load it for you. But. Just, just hit a time. That's all I did. <laughs> so based on no the numbers. industry standard, what... Should we be and maybe a question now might be is when would you like the model balanced to? So in previous years we would balance this model out to 2040. So no red till 2040. This one was balanced to 2027. We ran a bunch of different versions that balanced to 2030. So that's a, a big question too. Sorry. Can can we first plug in the hundred million dollar to the plant? Sure. I think we could show you option three. No. So option three. So option three is. Um, Would you like to see option I, I two so. next? That was the. Uh, yeah, should we see option? No, I think go straight to that third one, which which is what Councilor Zadi got. As a point of clarification, when we have capital improvement, and so this is where I need definition on apples to apples on what you present to council on a budget. Because in looking at the budget that we just um, approved on consent today, right? And so the operating cost of our water says operating budget versus actual, and it's around 45 million, right? Um, so does operating budget include 
DIP? Does it include staffing? Does it include all the, so that's what, and so does the capital project, the CIP here reflect the same thing? Like, I don't see, like, where's that salary add in this? Does that make sense? Like, I don't Yes, that makes the, sense. So, so those three categories that Brian showed you for the expenses, CIP, O&M, and debt service are as follows. So CIP are those really big projects, like an $8 million tank, like a $3 million pipeline, a big thing. The O&M is staff, it's parts, it's contracts, it's chemicals. So the chemical budget tonight. Sodium permanganate. 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 Just stop trying. I don't <laughs> Those, those would show up in the operating budget because they are part of operating the utility. So, so then that cost then is reflected in an operating budget of yes. what was presented to council. Yes. So when you look at the funding source, it will say utility fund operating budget, or it'll say utility fund capital budget. Tonight's chemicals will come out of utility fund operating budget. The debt service is our um, what we owe on our existing bonds and loans. So our principal and interest on that. <clears throat> Why does that number go up two million dollars this year? That's put me in the debt oh. service. Yeah, because that's how our payments are structured. So our finance team works to keep our payments as even as possible, so they're not all over the place. So they'll do maybe interest up front. Sorry, this is your world, um, and then more principal later on. But even does your even model more. account for um, when the debt drops off? Absolutely. Each of the issues is loaded in. Right. Thank and, you. and as we add that in, it projects future debt service. So it all calculates within this master control. So when we get to the point of adding in debt, if we get to that part in here, you'll see the debt service change annually. So this is just another version of the model that we built. Um, it has the same revenue reduction, um, minus 5.9 million. We have the CIP defined uh, 24 million, the 10 year average. 22 through all out years. This includes $100 million for a Semper solution in years 23 through 25. It also includes additional funding from ARPA and the general fund to the tune of 33 million. What it does not in include yet uh, is the, you know, the, the present in increases. Um, of potentially 4% of 23 uh, and onward, which we, which Brian can add in um, at any time to show you how this might really look, which I think is getting closer to what Councillor Zadi was asking for, which is show, show me uh, the capital program sustained, show me uh, uh, the replacement water facility um, in this mo in this scenario, that, which would be more of a semper based solution than a, than a, a new site. Um, so this is not a new site? I don't think for a hundred million dollars it is. No. No. So and then what's the just estimate for a new site? Two hundred and five is the current one, roughly. Okay. Roughly. But we paused design at that at 20, just under thirty percent. So we we don't have a more refined figure on that one yet. That's going to go up as we delay yeah. anyway. So it's like two twenty, two thirty. Mm -hmm. So that's the okay. Let's walk. Let's finish this. But but can can we get to that? The two hundred version two. Could I, could I sure. regarding the clear, just to clarify, so sure. you've distributed the cost of this facility for 23, 24, and 25, and That's we're paying correct. it like That's theoretically correct. out of pocket somewhere. Um, but I'm assuming there's a debt issuance. Absolutely. So, and that's not in here yet. Not in here yet. I just want to show you how we balance that with, you know, with a combination of rates and debt. And that really speaks to this line 34 here, but you could see the red in the model. So we balance through 2023. That's to say that we use up our entire capital project reserve uh, by 2023. At this point, we need to issue debt to counterbalance the rate increases that we have and the loss of, of revenue. So we can build that in right here. And then we have a calculation to the far right that figures debt to CIP ratio. And again, that ratio uh, industry standard is, is usually between 40 and 60%. And this is at our current rates? No, this is with the reduction of revenue. So all these uh, scenarios that we're showing you have the revenue reduction built in. 
So question as defined. For the debt, if we add in debt, does it calculate then how we pay that debt back? It does. So that shows up in the debt service. So this is our current debt service. As I add debt, um, are we? As I add debt to the scenario, these numbers will increase. But wouldn't they not? If so, we wouldn't. We wouldn't pay down our current reserve as fast if we're paying, if we issue debt and are paying a smaller amount that's annually actually, for a longer that's time. That's correct, right? That's correct. But is that I don't see where is the debt service? We're, we're going to build it in. Right building in yet? We're, we don't Based have any debt built in yet, but we're going to build it in right now. Okay. Aren't that's we our I'm impatient. Okay. So. Regulatorily, to pay back debt for water use by from water rates. Yes. So our so, water rates pay, that's built in to our water rates is yep. paying back debt service. We peel it out separately here. It can be considered an operating cost. It's not a capital cost. It can be considered an operating cost. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. I'm just going to play with this a little bit and add some debt. Um, and if you can focus on year 25, our CPR minimum, our capital project reserve minimum is 3 million. That's how I'm balancing this model we can reduce the amount of debt almost so we would need 69 million debt issuance in 23. Chris can you can you explain what Brian means by the the minimum needing to be three million dollars? Yes so city council adopted some financial policies for the utility many years ago and there is a rate stabilization reserve which covers us for literally like rainy days rainy summers and then there's the capital project reserve there is a floor on the capital project reserve. It cannot go below $3 million for water and $2 million for sewer. So when Brian's saying he's balancing to that minimum, he is saying we need to keep that floor of $3 million present. What happens if we go below? Council needs, well, we bust our policy. Bust so policy. Council, council would have to say we would like to change the policy to be something different. But that's internal policy. Yes. But it's, like, it's yes. like $3 million in case something blows. Like yes. A, Go breaks. Yes. Yep. So for emergency. Emergencies. <laughs> so previous council set parameters for for this model uh, for us, and, yeah. and we have to follow those. It also has to do with capital project contingencies as well. You know, the engineering team is doing a hundred million dollars in project estimates. You know, some will come in higher, some will come in lower over time. But just in case uh, a very high necessity project comes in higher. We have that contingency in the capital project mm -hmm. as well. Understanding there's we have challenges in the general fund budget. I know that you can per taper, what is it, 10% that we could well, what is that number on a normal 10% of that uh, rate revenue? So if you scroll up, yes, please. Yeah. So 10% so of 45, 44, 47. So well, four point. it would be 10% of row 19. You know, so can be what ten, ten, ten percent of row nineteen can can what can be transferred. Oh, can you, can you show us what it looks like? Like if you change half a percent, is that a big difference? Like if, if you did a four and a half percent increase yeah. versus yeah. a four percent. The other thing is the five point nine million in rate reduction could be changed as well along the way. So it's, it's your point of it's Okay. Yeah, sure. Did you want to try to balance this to a certain year? Let's say 2030. That's something normally we would do. And then look at the debt to CIP ratio to see if we're within those limits. Why did you only put 69 million in debt issuance? Uh, because we want to balance to uh, the closest year possible. So in this case, it will be 25. So now I'm going to add more debt to balance us to 30. Um, let's try 30 million here and then show you the ratio. So now you can see we're looking at year 27. So this number could be more like 28. You can see I'm trying to not bust the minimum as Chris was speaking to. And that does it. You can see the 3 million right here. So, so, now, oh, okay. so now we need to issue, I mean, we could certainly issue um, more debt in a, in a give, any given year. It's just really it's how we balance the model to show the absolute lowest need of, per that giving year. And so can you scroll up to so somewhere up here, the debt number? 
our debt coverage number. I'll increase. show you the debt, debt service. service. Yeah, okay. the, uh, you want to see the debt service? Coverage? Yeah, just okay. So now it's I'll, ten I'll million, it's right? Because that's yeah, you can see that that service uh, starting to creep up. So we were at about five five million, and now you can see it at eight. But this is balancing, so that's that's okay. And when we look at really this number out here, which measures the debt to CIP ratio, we're only at 24%. So that number is important because just like, I mean, my analogy is personal finances. I don't want to use my credit card for every single thing, but I'm also not going to save up for buying a house out of cash. So we want to find the right balance for how much we fund our projects through cash and how much we fund through bonds and loans. And the industry best practice is not more than 60%. So we want to, we don't want to certainly fund everything hundred percent by bonds and loans. That's unsustainable and unrealistic, but we also don't want to use zero because it's a tool that we want to have at our disposal that we want to use that we have used. During the, during the cost of service study, the Raftalis did find that we were underutilizing debt quite substantially. Okay. But that's what this, you know, that's why we built this really this kind of ratio into the model. So we could understand, you know, how far we could go with that to bump up that ratio to keep rates at, you know, a manageable level. So theoretically, we could go up to forty percent. We could go up to sixty percent. Oh, sixty percent. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying number. to find it. I've asked in the past. Like so, before fifteen sixteen, we were pretty steady on what percent, and that's why I asked like what four and a half percent does, because I've been. I know at one point I was given all the increases over probably 15, 20 year period. Um, and I know at one point they would do like a bigger increase over two years and then they split it out and they were doing something like four or 5% every year. Do you, is that, am I right on that? Is it 4%, four and a half percent? You're, you are right on both counts. So we had, um, we started in 2000 setting a rate and then doing a 0% the next year. So it would be 6% in one year, 0% the next year. So effectively that's a 3% every year. For a series of years, there were 4%. And that was 2009 through 12, I believe. And then they went up after that. So what's the and, and math is not my thing. So forgive my ignorance. Huh. But is the, the compounding effect better when you do every two years versus a smaller every year? Over time, is that more they can just break even at the end of the day if you pick the right the right numbers. I think, and just to, so I can be sure, we're, we had zero for 2021 and 2022. So, so we had no, no, like 6% one year and then zero the next. So no, no, but for 2021, yes. it was a zero yes. in 22. So that, yes. but I think the question, part of your question is, is it is it more advantageous to the utility to do 6% up front or 3% each year? Yeah. If you do six percent up front, you get the six percent on day one, right, right? Right. If you do, if you split it in half, you you don't get the six percent until day one of year two. Right. So you get you collect more revenues by doing it all up front. And and the other half of that equation is the rate payer side, is they pay the rate increase right up front, and they can see that that rate holds steady then for two years. So although they end up paying a little bit more that way, it's it's fixed for two years versus what, maybe and maybe you know this. What was the shift? Why did we shift? from a bigger one every two years, was it, did it feel better to the rate payers or was, does anybody know why we switched from every two years versus? So it could be a combination of when we moved to a biannual budget because we were doing budgets every single year. It could be um, the fact that we did a cost of service study back in 2005 with a consultant who said, I'm guessing, I'm trying to remember that was a long time ago. <laughs> um, this is probably best practice for you to do but we moved away in the early aughts and have been doing every single year revenue increases since then. Well, I, I guess what I'm getting at is I think somewhere between, you know, four, five seems more reasonable to me. Like I know that it was four before with inflation and everything else, it's pretty out of control. And we were as a city are getting hit with those just as much as individuals are. So trying to balance our needs versus what people can afford. Um, so I, I'm just curious if they're, you know, is for the right number or five. I think once you get up past that, it's probably something I'm not comfortable with, but 
I think that that's reasonable if you look at what people typically are getting. We kind of we bounced that around quite a bit, and it was just one. Okay, let's pick a four. You know, uh, yeah, the, the substantial change is half a percent. A well, lot. Let's run it. We can we can plug it in, right, Brian? Yeah, and I think um, when we talked about what a percentage increase in revenue would mean, I think it was in the range of four hundred thousand for water. So let's let's run the four percent versus point four point five, and you can see the change in yeah, revenue for rates. Uh, so okay. here's. Let me go back to uh, fours, if I may. And you can see that revenue. And I'll just, um, what are the rates at by then? They're set at four. No, oh. I mean, like, we're starting at, you know, whatever we are right now, 352 or whatever. What are they? After that many years of increasing, do we have a spreadsheet that shows that? In the background of this model, yes, we do. Just bear with me here. So this would be the revenue uh, in line 15 at 4%. And then I'll switch the. Uh, Rate increases to four and a half. Now we could figure out the difference. So two hundred thousand. So I was about right. So so one percent increase is about four hundred k. Why, why is uh, the CIP, if you've already added the debt service and why is the CIP still reading at 60, you know, what, why? 62 million? Yeah. So this has a uh, $100 million included for some Semper solution or other water. But it wouldn't project. hit our books like that? Yeah, we still have cash in from the borrowing and cash out for the CIP. Oh. Uh, well, so that's accounted for here. Oh, further down? Because I'm still looking at that. Yep, sorry, I can, I can page down. Yeah. That's helpful. Sorry, I'm seeing red there. Okay. Yeah, that's still, um, you know, the, the deficit. But when we add this the payment from debt the, yeah. in, then we balance at the bottom. And really, that's where we want to see, uh, you know, our okay. cash ending balance or capital project reserve. And so how far does that buy us? 2027. One of the things that should be brought up relative to this is that before, you know, Brian's doing some great work here to illustrate the cash in, cash out, and the needs and so forth relative to the capital plan. In order to borrow those funds, our team would have to present a capital plan for the utility for at least 10 years. And of course, any lender, creditor, bar, uh, bank would want to see a capital program that is known and understood by uh, the, the mayor and council. Um, and um, sensible and jives with what the utility has done in the past. And then that investment bank would say, okay, that looks like a fair and reasonable capital plan for this utility going forward and a feasible capital plan as well. So Brian's kind of illuminating how debt works in the model, but then secondary, it needs to be debt that's feasible to issue as well. So the red so, on 2028 and beyond is not going to, that that probably will not make it viable because a creditor will want to know well how are we going to preserve the assets that deliver the water that create the revenue that repays the debt that that's the very simple equation now christine gray does a great job of illustrating kind of cash versus pay as you go versus debt financing and so forth that helps but we need to have still a capital plan a lot of that's just driven by the ordinary revenue as it was so uh, this is a great illustration but I think if we show this to a creditor, it wouldn't, wouldn't get by the investment bank uh, to, to issue that. So essentially we should be out of the red for the next 10 years. It's kind of what you're saying. 10 years is a, is a but, pretty aggressive. But in this, so, so you're saying $100 million. So when you're doing that, that uh, financing to get you to that 10 years, you could one tactic could be to decrease what that $100 million is and figure out where you break even and then figure out with what you have, what you could actually feasibly go do to the utility in that period of time. 
it, it would also have to relate somewhat to what's been done in the previous 10 years as well. Sure. Um, you know, it can be a 10 cents on the dollar. It doesn't need to be $3 on the dollar either. It needs to be, you know, within sort of a sensible range. Sure. Okay, does this include you. the 10, the 10% 10 Tabor transfer exception? Is that the only exception? And does this include that? I don't, Brian, is it, I don't know if it's in this version yet or not. Yes. So we, we have built into this version of, for 2022, ARPA and general fund monies to the tune of 33 million. So that would be, uh, I think, placed in 20 year 2022. But let me just make sure that's correct. And clarification in that scenario, that's not an ongoing subsidy. That's just a three year subsidy to help offset the cost of the plan. Or whatever. The 10% yeah. yeah. they'll transfer from the general fund to the long fund. Is that it? Just speak up. <laughs> All right. So, Sorry. I'm going to give legal advice. And Chris, can you come up to the right. Absolutely. Regarding finance, go ahead. So <laughs> the dedication of capital into the utility enterprise fund is exempt from that 10% rule. So say we purchased property out of the general fund and then dedicated it to the, to the utility fund, that's an acceptable uh, way we can get around the 10 percent cap so that's just one instance of a manner in which we could spend more than 10 percent in one year but still remain within the enterprise uh, designation now we should get a lawyer to talk you through it. <laughs> <laughs> but that's generally my understanding we've done things like that previously well in in to the point of the 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 general fund dollars though that's more short-term planning year to year versus long-term planning so i mean we would have to try to balance those two things right you'd have to say i know that these projects are coming up in the next four years i know that we have this much carryover or this much right. budget that we can throw at it these funds exist because of 165 vacancies in 2021 and a significant number or sales tax was up or what yeah. you know, all the different variables that go into that I, just to put that in perspective, so as we talk about this, um, some of those projects include um, emptying out the reserve account that's sitting there for the municipal court replacement, um, some unfunded projects that are on our list that aren't funded in the current CIP include uh, data and network upgrades, fire station floor replacement, uh, rodeo market renovation. So as I was kind of preparing for this meeting, those are some of the things that we don't have funding for currently in the general fund. So this would, I can't say it would hit those specifically, but certainly it would decrease our ability to do capital projects in the general fund. So there's a cost to having lower rates. So can we see that 200 million option? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes we can. So we currently have 100 million split across three years, 34, 30, you have that built in. Right, yeah, <laughs> Do math. 34, 34 million in 23 okay. and then 33 yeah. respectively in 24 yeah. 25. So if we just double that yeah. investment, that will give us a good idea of what we would need to do. And again, it's a combination of rates and debt that will help us get there. So we're adding in another hundred million dollars on top of the hundred million dollars we already have in oh, the CIP. In the so this will essentially give us two hundred million dollars towards something. Got it. Okay. By the end of twenty twenty five. It's not going to buy you the Broncos, I hear. <laughs> Damn it! <laughs> not even one percent share. Might be the special teams, but yeah. uh, the snapper maybe <laughs> they're not worth. <laughs> and this also doesn't take into account. Maybe this was already asked, but this also doesn't take into account refinancing the funds. No. Okay. So when when and if that comes up, Larry would be working on that with his team. To get the best deal. Yeah, but I that. Yes. It's uh, get your sharp okay, pencil. <laughs> Work the number. Never done that before. <laughs> so we added a two hundred million dollar water plant into this scenario. When we were working on this scenario previously with a two hundred million dollar plant, these fours were sixes, and then we needed additional debt on top of that. So do we want to start there? 
Uh, because we're already, um, we only balanced through 2022 in, in this scenario. So now what's left in the model, if you don't change those percentages in out years okay. or future years, is to act, is to start to change um, the rate, the, the, the tier rate structure itself, right? So make the starting point higher revenue um, than what you see in the top yellow there. So you might say, um, well, let's let's change the Baker Seymour yeah. numbers to be three million reduction or four million four million to Councilor Baker's gonna throw something at me here. Um, four million dollar reduction or something like that. That's another big dial that you would play with at this point if you started to become uncomfortable with six percent, right? Because you can't get it on both ends, right? In this that's model, you have without taking a crazy amount of debt. Right, but this is also the 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 two hundred million dollar option, which is which is why we're running it to show yeah. you that that far bookend of capital need, of capital um, expenditure. You know, the reason why I wanted to see this option, which seems I don't know, those numbers are scary, but it's because the superintendent of Semper said we cannot rehab. I trust him; he's been there a long time. He he's an expert. So I'm assuming we need to have a new plan. I don't know how or where, which we can figure out, but if a new plant costs $200 million and we need to have a new plant, and these are the numbers, it's scary. It doesn't work. So how do we get around that? How we're looking at other options. Yeah, I'm not saying that the, the superintendent at Semper is not an expert. But once upon a time, an expert said you couldn't go to the moon and a different expert said the hell we can't. So at some point, we have to come up with other experts to give us other looks at it. And that doesn't mean that that expert's not an expert and he's not, you know, rightfully uh, educated and experienced in his realm. It just means that sometimes somebody else knows a different way to do something. Okay, and we all agree that no expert sits at this end of the table. We have we have the budget money though, and we decide what we're going to spend. But we need expert, external to us advice on. We've been getting it for three, four years, sitting at this table, and so that's part. Like that, well, we're not understandably, that some of our advice. Well, we have to decide. We we hold the keys to the budget, and we have to decide what's that's, what's the limit. Well, but what, that's what not even have, fully what? true. That's not even fully true for you to say that. I I. I not only have sat at this table, but I've talked to people who have sat at this table prior that say that this plan isn't what we need to do. And that's why we've asked to have those experts come in and talk to us. It's not that I'm saying I know how to build a water plant because I sure, sure as heck wouldn't do that. It's I'm not comfortable with this. And my stead and authority given to me by the voters of this city were holding the city accountable with their tax dollars. I am not comfortable with what we're doing. Let me clarify what I was saying. I was saying that the experts that I thought Councilor Seymour was referring to, which was the people we've heard from so far, are not. What we're, you know, you're saying that there's probably somebody else out there. Maybe it's the question that we ask of them, um, but there may be somebody else out there outside of the people that we've talked to up till now that could provide us with some input, right? Potentially, the other thing I would throw in there, and and this is not to demean anyone or belittle anybody's position who's worked for the city, but there has been a straight um, unwillingness to talk about other options up until we have had a different council. I've been asking for some of these conversations that we're having now, I begged for in 2018, but it was just me and I was cast off as a troublemaker who just was trying to cause trouble. And, you know, I, and, and I can take it. We signed up for this. We signed up to take all the, you're just trying to do what's politically expedient. If I wanted to do what's politically expedient, I could have kept my mouth shut for four years. I mean, that would have been a lot less trouble for me personally. The, the point is, is at some point, we have to have these real conversations. And I am more than pleased that we're actually having these conversations now. But I've also never once said 100% no to the replacement of Semper. I've never said 100% no to being off Westminster Boulevard. I just am, I'm at like 10% that says maybe that's a good idea. And if we can 
any otherwise, great. But the other thing is at some point, this is just not feasible for people. When we talk about 10% or $10, I've, I've heard this term used. I've even used the term myself. It's a cup of coffee. Like That's great when you're fundraising to run for office. That's not so good when you say, okay, it's just a, a cup of coffee this month, but then next year we're going to take another cup of coffee from you. And then the year after we're going to take another cup of coffee that, you know, 10 years later, it's a hundred dollars. And understanding that, you know, that's the nature of some of this, we have to come up with a, a, a better solution where it's not, it's not expanding at such a rapid rate. We, you know, there's the two years where I was very adamantly against what we did in 18, but Prior to COVID, we were going to do something that was just as equally impactful to the pockets of the people who live in the city. I mean, you guys remember, right? Right before COVID, there was another two years worth of big increases, followed by some more big increases. And I just don't see how it's sustainable for, for people to, to do that. So we need to, we have to have a starting point that we at least do for the next two years. And then we're going to, in the meantime, we're going to have some of these hard conversations that say, how can we fund something that this, everybody who's at this table, both sides of this table, because I, I do want staff to be comfortable because they're the ones who have to go execute and they are the experts, but we have to come up with something that is within the means of the people who live in the city. And it has to be something that does all the things a water utility has to do regulatorily. So, my one question would be, as we're looking at, and I think I, I mentioned this before, so I'm just going to underline it, that as we are, you know, whether it's 100 million or 200 million, that, and also I'm still not convinced of the $24 million number that's in here, so really, please do advise on that. But um, at what point, you know, if we do a $100 million approach, how long does that buy us in terms of needing to reinvest to the same degree? Um, and, you know, I don't know, is it enough to pay debt service down? What is it, 30, 40 years? Boom. Oh, good. It lasted us. Now we can do another hundred million and just like, is that feasible to do? Or is this can $200 million? The, dollar? The, this, that he, he, he's still running through. The $200 million? Come back to 100 million? Yeah. So what I built in um, after we added an additional hundred million, uh, I put the rates at five percent, and then started to build the debt in in combination with that rate of five percent to see where we are with the debt to CIP ratio. Now it may make sense here to reduce this reduction, uh, but we can get to that because basically we would need 101 million in 22 to balance the model. In revenue? On that, based on those needs. Now we still meet in, that percentage, that's that that's that's right? ratio, that's yes. yep, at 44%. And the model now balances twenty twenty six. But in essence, what I'm saying here is that we wouldn't reduce revenue with the need this great. What's the ratio at? 44. 44%. I'd, I'd like to remind everybody of one good point that Councilor Baker brought up a couple weeks ago is the one of the big challenges of cost, from my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, with going to a whole new site is you have tens of millions of dollars worth of, of repiping to a new facility. Uh, I seem to recall 50 being the number stuck in my head. So when you're talking 200 million for a new plant, 50 of that is to pipe to a new plant. I mean, that's a substantial thing that we should think about that we may not, if we come up with a good solution, talking to experts that may take a quarter of that cost out. I'm gonna look at Julie because she's the one who's gonna be talking about the semper, yeah. but that's a fair point. So what, what are our options? What will, what are the dollar amounts? What are the trade-offs? We can build that in, go from there. Well, and even when you guys were talking the last couple of years for all of this, as you were increasing the rates um, and you had a $250 million replacement um, cost, you were gonna have to do it over 30 years. I worked in the investment banking for 10 years 
And that just said red flag to me, you did not have enough money mm -hmm. and you're proving it. So. So this is the rate, again, going back to that uh, counselors Baker and Seymour proposed. What is, so currently our rates are at 365 and I think it's ballpark in that three dollars and sixty ish cents Current for tier one. Current rate are three ninety six for oh, tier one up to six thousand gallons mm -hmm. and eight fifteen. Right because for tier two we, and tier three. Because we collapsed ray three to the same as two. In this proposal, we actually raised tier three. You raised tier three to mm -hmm. twelve tier two, right? And we lowered tier two. We lowered tier two. We raised tier three. This put this puts oh. tier this puts tier three back in at nine fifty four. So you lowered it because current rate is twelve eighty eight. Right. Yeah. Well, right now, right now. it's eight fifteen. And oh, I see. Yeah. 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 Okay. okay. Like, can we put the tier three rate at nine fifty four because that's the penalty rate that really commercial businesses pay if they exceed their allowance under their meter size because. Really, commercial payers have so much water allocation based on the size of their water meter. So, or sort of like based on the size of the lot. And this bumps tier one up to 8,000 8, gallons, gallons to make sure we get all household mm -hmm. inside use. Can we play with the rates at all and just look at like what if it was we kept tier one where it was and obviously keeping the boosting it to 8,000 gallons and then tier two, you know, whatever. I don't know. What do you, what do you have it at seven? Well, no, uh, we have it right now at 554 and we put from it from 815, right? From, right. From 815. Well, um, I think there's some room in there. We've already given some relief. Um, well, see, I look at it through a different lens. And I look at what comparable cities do. And comparable cities seem to handle CIP and planning and replacement. I mean, we're not unique that, well, the soil of Westminster devours pipes in the ground. I mean, that's why in so many things we do, in so many of our endeavors, we look at best practices. We look at comparable things of what other cities do because there's wisdom to be gained there. So it's for me, it's always been a question why we're so far off from what comparable cities do. I wouldn't say a best practice is to, you know, just throw out numbers on based on other cities' um, fees. Well, one of the problems is, is you read the uh, uh, email we got from, uh, our city manager on the 28th of January, right? And it had the, what I had asked for in the uh, uh, breakdown of the water rates, how much was operating costs and how much was really of the capital costs. Because in one of our meetings, that's what our really utilities OP director said is how they got the rates, right? We're already 32% based on our last analysis below being even on the cost of delivery of water and what our revenues are. That's what that study said. That's what we paid those engineers to tell us. And that is exactly what they tell us. I doubt, I mean, the veracity of what they told us. Well, as a pharmacist, would you like it if I doubt the veracity of, you know, if you spent 20, 30 years working as a pharmacist, you know, whether or not you put my drugs together well. I mean, we, we have to at some point believe in the expertise that we're given. Uh, I did find one tangible thing as to the cost. And it was in the water 2025. And it said that we were going to make water to, to, make, to, to make a thousand gallons of water would cost us 92 cents. 
That number, actual, okay. I, actual I cost that. of making a thousand gallons of water was 92 cents. Um, anyway, back to
Testing, testing, one, two, three.
We're good to go. We're rolling. Question. Um, we could be here all night. Um, I think Jody and staff has heard <clears throat> all over the place um, what everybody's thinking. Can they bring back real numbers, two or th maybe three or four scenarios that show us um, what you've heard tonight, how far out we need to get, what that would look like, maybe even some rate changes, structures we've heard you guys say, maybe that. What just, you've heard it, we need the real pieces and we need to get on to our second question. My computer. Um, of, uh, do we want what the, the second question? Who's got that in front of them? The study for direct uh, oh, staff really to direct do. staff to place as the highest priority answering the alternative site questions yep. with the money that's already been budgeted. And so. and I asked Jody when they we don't have a meeting next week because I forgot it's President's Day. Yeah. So they would bring their proposals back for another study session after our regular meeting the 28th um, to look at real scenarios from what he's heard from everybody tonight. Uh, I would prefer just to go ahead and uh, make our really proposal and vote. Uh, I don't think we're going to gain anything more. Conversely, I think we would gain a lot. What the, what the proposal would be for next year. I mean, no matter what, we'd have to look at future years, so right? It's for this year. We need to set rates. This year. Let me excuse my uh, tiredness. <laughs> but it wouldn't be forever. We're not saying, like, no. they, we still want ever. something yeah. to come back. Absolutely. See. We have to look at these every year. And I think it would be fine not to even lock ourselves into 2023. Right. I think we could look at different alternatives for 2023. I have no problem with that. So but that I true? think we need to give the people of Westminster assurance that this summer they're going to be able to water their lawns. And I don't think they have that right now. Well, with you coming back, I mean, you would be able to give something far before summer. I mean, we're not talking waiting months. Yeah, may I comment on the timing? Uh, of course. Very good questions, very good uh, dialogue on, on the timing. Um, depending on the nature of the changes, if um, I would want to comment um, that on a lot size based structure, we have two issues that, that will take some time to vet out. One is a legal question with the charter, and that is that we are, are not able to discriminate between um, you, uh, between users um, with what we charge them for the utility. However, there is a solution that is possibly to set new categories of lot sizes, um, which which um, which the city attorneys reviewed with us. That would take quite a bit of time because we'd have to gather the data on all of our ratepayers' lot sizes for their homes, and then we would have to work to set categories for those. So that we council could tell us to do that. We would undertake that work we begin it right away. We do the legal work and then we would do the, the lot based work. If council desired something to happen faster this year um, than that model, then we would uh, that solution. We would look at that in parallel with a with a with a with a more um, um, timely change, um, and that would be uh, just changing the rate structure to be um, rates per as they are today. We'd reintroduce the potentially the third tier, and then we would just set new rates for each of those three tiers, and then explore a lot size based. Um, modification to that in the next uh, rate setting cycle, if that would work, then you would still get your reductions um, in in that scenario. You would still get um, um, reductions to your rates, um, and we would work on the lot mm -hmm. size base. It's just that one we just don't have the data because when we set this is what comes up when we set our and send out bills, our ratepayers are legally required to pay those bills. So it's not something that we get to almost get right. We, we really are obligated to get those utility bills correct, and and that's why we needed we need to do the work on that. And the thought on on um, lot size comparison, um, we could do it by by class. Let's just throw out a number. Um, this lot size 
between here and here is one grouping. We have so many tiers because we use tiers already of lot sizes in that case. And then we would hopefully be able to pass the non-discriminatory test on that because we'd lump a range together. Right, in a separate tier. Okay. Classification. Doesn't Thornton do that? Use lot no, size? I mean, Thornton actually bases theirs on lot size. They base their tier on lot size. I believe, and Kristen can correct me if I'm wrong, this is entrenched in Wisconsin, our charter. Right, it's because you're having two different rates within the same classification, which... So home rule, we have a different charter than Thornton. We would have to look at how Thornton did it. That would be the very first thing we would do um, and see if there was a parallel for us or not because they have a different charter than we do. Um, and if there wasn't, then the attorney's office has already come up with a solution, uh, which is to set categories. Mm -hmm. And that would uh, that would get us out of the, 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 the legal challenge of a discriminatory uh, pricing structure. Um, but the second part of my answer to that timing question was that if we went into a simpler rate change, which is the way we've done it in the past, right, which is which is a rate um, per tier, um, then we could do that in probably 45 to 90 days, I believe is what our utility billing people are telling us. We put put on that post haste um, and we could make a change between 45 and 90 days if it was based on our current structure, of how we structure our tiers. If we alter the structure of the tiers, we're into deeper work, A, on the charter analysis, but second, most importantly, on the utility billing side, on how those lot sizes are determined legally and then um, assigned to every account number. and then categorized and assigned to each account number. So we'd have to assign a category code to each rate pair, which we don't do right now. They actually are, are, are you'll correct me if I'm wrong, but our bills go out based on their usage, not on any other factor that we would now add to that calculation. C would be the impact of the model because that's going to change the output in the model, won't it? I mean, sorry, the... If we go by, we <coughs> change the rates to go by land area, then that's going to change what were our revenues. Mm -hmm. So that's just like another right. piece to that puzzle. Um, one, I'm, one question I have for my colleagues is, would you be interested in um, asking staff to do a, um, to look at a roundup program where people could opt in to round up their bill to, I don't know what, um, so that we could enhance our, um, uh, like help for seniors who are on fixed incomes or for families that are on fixed incomes, that we could increase well, uh, it would have been helpful, and this is not on the subject. It would have been helpful if you told us that this was a problem sooner. What was the problem? That, 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 okay, that we can't go to lot size. But, and that's on me, because um, I had that discussion and it didn't, it didn't click to me, and my, my apologies, but it, it didn't make sense until... Okay, and so, but still we run into a problem. I mean, we still have a good, we have a foundation to plug in those numbers. And if we're taking, say, worst case scenario, things happen, that's life. If we're looking at 90 days, we're talking around the 1st of May and we're watering season. So, you know, to give, so if we don't look at this, and, and here again, to Mayor Pro Tem's point, and our point too, is that we, we look at these water rates every year, you know. Um, the 2018 study gave us the map, but we still went back and revisited them every year and we had to okay them along that process. And so, you know, this is, this is, this is a starting point. Everything changes in the model. We can tweak everything. We can look at, okay, inflation's hitting us, we need to go to a 6% increase, so it's still pennies. And you know, the other the other side of this too is, the reason there was an adjustment, the thought on tier one was, wanted to make sure that we had something for all of our residents, because the ones that had the least ability to pay, you know, everybody gets some relief, lowered the price and added a couple more thousand, thousand gallons per month 
to try to help out in that standpoint. So my biggest thought on that one was it will help out in the summer. A lot of many of them will never get close to that. But in the summer months, if they're trying to grow their own food, whatever they have in their yard, mm -hmm. they won't tip into tier two. Yeah, and, and even, you know, some of our bigger families, you know, I'm sure they, they tip towards that too. So, you know, that that was really the thought on that. Um, and and I, I, I see this as one of those things that we could still be doing the same thing in June, the same discussion. So I, I'm in favor of, you know, putting this out and having the discussion in public and and looking at what this does for our model this year, and then we can start modeling forward because we can always add on, we can always adjust. That's my two cents. One thing that you mentioned, Council, Councilman Seymour, um, you're talking about helping all of our residents. I just um, a question that I asked earlier from staff is, we have a lot of residents who live in multifamily style units, duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes multifamily buildings. Um, do we have, um, I, it's hard for me to understand, you know, what is the need or is there a need um, or concern for residents in these smaller um, or these multifamily scenarios? Because don't they pay $7 and something per gallon? So multifamily and apartments pay seven fifty five per thousand gallons. Um, Duplexes will pay the normal tier structure. We don't have, and fourplexes, we don't have any triplexes. Mm -hmm. So is your question about assistance programs for multifamily tenants? Well, I'm just, Councilman Seymour was saying, right, that we're helping all of our residents, but we're not really help. We're not really with this. It's single family and apparently up to four Single plexes. family detached up to fourplexes. But typically in a multifamily, you're not paying your, Per gallon. I mean, I lived in. However, they're on one meter, right? Depending on how many you have in the building. You know. But still, I mean, I guess if you're owner occupied, maybe it hits you. But like in an apartment, they're not coming back to me and saying, "Hey, our usage was this much this month. Now your rent went up to this." I mean, your rent is is fixed by your lease. Sure. I mean, but I just. It's a, it's a built-in cost and on most Eventually, of course, it hits them because, I mean, then rents go up potentially. But, I mean, I, I guess I just haven't heard. And there's no outdoor use. Apples and oranges. Is I there guess. a need for it? I, like, I don't know. Do we have a lot of multifamily shut-offs? No. <laughs> apartment buildings pay their bills. Yeah. Not the whole apartment. I thought we had separate meters in some of our new. Most I think only yeah, the condo, don't really condos have separate meters. New, no, newly yeah. built. Yeah, we haven't had any new built ones in a long no, time to know. No, I had a 1976 build and it's one meter. One meter. Yeah, new ones. All right, I just yeah, had to ask. Uh, so water usage is more stable in multi units. Yeah. So when the landlord gets his one bill, he can fix the lease. It's more because it's more stable. So it's not it's not a problem. More okay. retrospective on the lease. Okay, thank you. Or HOA dues. Okay, what direction do you want to give? Well, are we going to give okay direction about the alternatives? Well, I think we were stuck on whether or not we were going to go with your your proposal. We've heard two yeses, and I haven't heard right. Are we going to pull for that? Or sounds like that was the that's request. that's the movement I'm making along the table here. But your proposal deals with uh well we have we have the complicating value of would lot size violate the charter right but we can still go with the base premises on the tiers correct would we still feel comfortable with that the 354 the 554 and the 954 from tier rate uh well then i would want to i would want to dramatically increase all the tier sizes dramatically increase the tier sizes then i think that answers your question then we're not ready to move a rate forward right so you guys need whatever 
that thought is by what you've been working on it needs to get to Jody and you need to work with them and then let them from everything they've heard from all of us work on three or four others two or three other proposals and make them real so we can look at them and then make some decisions with the goal of it the happening before summer right yeah because if we do this the 28th they still have time well then we would first of march we would have to vote on it and if we find a solution well it can be the 14th of march Okay. But even without the change in the, the tier ranges in that mid tier, we're already talking a 32% rate decrease. Yeah, that's true. So, yeah, I'm just trying to figure out how we can kind of find a middle on this to move forward. Let's talk. Madam Mayor, will you please define what you mean by real? Just a couple of explanations. Explanation, please. Concrete things we can look at and make some decisions instead of playing with numbers. You bring us how you looked at things, how it looks, and we can look at final numbers. Example in my mind would be we're going to do 100 million, we're going to put aside for CIP versus 200 million. And what does that look like in debt so that we're solvent in 10 years and you actually can put it in front of a lender and then that's 4% per year something to that effect so that we could then say, yep, that sounds great to me, instead of us saying, let's move our finger this way in the wind. So 10 years balancing some different CIP plans with some clarity from counselors Baker to see more about what they might like to see that's an adjustment to the current proposal. They come up with some adjustments that they think are good. They can feed that in for one of the scenarios and then Jody has some thoughts of to move forward. So, can I? I was just going to say because because real is you would be able to put it in front of a lender. Not real is here's what we put this number in, but a lender would never go for that. Like, I mean, so I don't know if you would agree with that, but that's what I would like to see. I second that. I would raise it with a. Uh, capital expenditure plan, annual capital expenditure number that uh, would also not make a bank flinch if we're not putting enough into supporting a $4 billion utility. It would, you know, just tell us what it should be then. Also the assumption that consumption will go, will decrease. Mm -hmm. I don't agree with that. I think supply and demand will show that people will use more Mm -hmm. So maybe a version that shows it increasing. That shows water use increasing. Okay. Yeah, we're kind of killing off the conservation. So how okay. many versions are we looking at for rates? Because I feel like if we have five, six different versions of rates, we're going to be right back here for another three hours discussing which one's better? 100 million with a basis, an annual CIP basis. That Which I think that you could set in that model, if I could jump in uh, to help. Uh, $100 million um, for replacement or rehabilitated facility. Um, set our CIP in this run at $24 million a year, which is an average. Um, and then have it. Uh, with the combine it with a with a uh, debt package that we can that can result in us being able to put this in front of lenders and have it funded. Um, so that would be one model, and that would be based on I think after Councilor Seymour and Baker regroup um, after tonight, and maybe potentially retool around the lot size based ones, and then feed in. We could base that on on that. We could also then take our best shot at a modified. Baker Seymour rate structure based on this discussion, just to because we we're going to get rid of the red um, in that scenario, and we could show that that scenario as well. And that would be have the, have all the other dials fixed at 124 and um, put in front of the lenders. Can we do that? 
Can we can we add just a sensitivity test, the 200 million piece? I mean, maybe, you know, just just so we know, I would like to know where, where rates would have to be at. Maybe that's like where they are right now or where they were. But I think it's helpful to have the full picture. Um, Judy, I think I heard from Mayor Pro Tem an alternative to the 24 million a year in capital. Maybe we could uh, produce a risk affordability description. Uh, we all understand the age and condition of Semper, but some of those projects that would be in that 10 year list, we could try to describe a level of risk and vulnerability to various tanks, various pumps, stations, things of that nature that describe a risk affordability offset, right? Okay. You could afford anything, there'd be very little risk, but you know, maybe that's a, an intersection we could explore. And I'd like an explanation, if you can give me it tonight, about how this would violate the charter. Well, uh, really lots of them. I, I can't give it to you tonight. I'd have to, I could get back to you tomorrow. I, I know the general basis was that you cannot you can't discriminate between class um, users. So if if you had two different rates per one classification, um, it would be you're um, discriminating against one party. Um, how or would one, have two different rates between one classification? Well, like if you set in tier two, you charge large lot owners a certain rate and you charge smaller lots a different rate. No, no. I mean, tier two would be based on the lot. It's not that you're charging different rates. It's they're based on the size of the person's lot. But it is, I mean, it's two different, it's different users. Are you saying the, the number of gallons that they're allowed? Mm -hmm. there, so there'd be elasticity in the size of the tier versus the size of the lot. I'd probably see that backwards. No, I think, I think you're close though, is that Because you're right, if we had two different rates inside the same tier, but we're talking about the lot size would have its rate. It's max would have be its tier based gallons on 10, the size gallons. of the lot. Right. Yeah. Okay. That, that, that's the thing. I mean, the tiers are the same. Right. I mean, it's the same tier concept we're using right now. It's so, just that where that tier, how big that tier is is based on the person's lot size. So just making up numbers, a third, a third of a lot, a third of an acre lot would have 8,000 gallons allowed in that tier. Uh, a one acre would be 20,000. A third of an acre is roughly uh, on the spot. Love it. Got to love it. Just okay. using square foot uh, numbers, you're better. A third of an acre is really 14,000 square feet. Okay. So the size of that tier two would be three times 14,000 or 42,000 gallons of water. And if they use more than that, then they pay tier three rates for the excess. It's like exceeding their cap size for a commercial. Yeah, it's 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 exactly like exceeding, exceeding their cap size because right now, I mean, the commercial users have a penalty that comes in if they use more than the size of their meter allows, right? That's, why we really That's what need we to have right the, now. We really need to do the financial on that because I, I feel there will be a lot of red on that thing. Well, for me, it all goes back to the CIP and how we're spending our CIP. And before I just blindly give a number to CIP, I want to know that we're using it. That's why I brought up the whole thing about the water, about the biosolids plant. I thought that was a frivolous waste of money. The great thing is we got a list, so we're not blind. We have a list of what that CIP is. So. And it wasn't frivolous because she debunked that. Right. Well, and, you know, we're talking about no, I'm going to, I'm not going to go into yeah, circle. Yeah, we, don't, we don't need to do that. I mean, we view it, we view it completely differently. So, all right. So, no, this and bunk from his. Yeah. One Jody, minute, do you have enough? Not to throw a variable on it. 
but you're gonna. <laughs> can we look at, can we look at Councilor Nermella's thought of, like, is that not to leave out apartments, condos, townhomes, like, what does that look like? Is that a reasonable? Can like, you say that again, please? I didn't quite apartments hear. Apartments and condos addre addressing that rate as well. But, but if, let's say we, let's say we lowered it. They're not going to see They're not going to lower it on anybody's <laughs> right. They're not going to put it in their pocket. Yeah. I can tell you that HOAs have increased due to city water. Yep. Right. I can tell you 100%. Right. Over the long term. But if we. No, not over the long term. As in like, I mean, I've lost. I, I personally have lost a home sale due to water. So we're here for a reason for reducing rates. In its entirety. Can I, can I, uh, for that, I feel like it's more addressing HOAs, but I know, so that does go into. I mean, they specifically uh, said in paperwork to residents, because Westminster is increasing water rates, we're increasing dues. Right. Which is mostly like, dues, who That's are, the but question. so true. home sales, single family. I'm not saying long term, but I mean, retroactively, yeah. like. Like it's like when the fuel it. costs go up and all of a sudden there's less chips in my bag and it costs me a dollar more. They don't put the chips back and <laughs> lower the price of Doritos. <laughs> they just wait till the next time gas goes up. They put up more air in it again. Okay. But never mind. Next place. I, okay. I, I agree with the, the intent of what you're going oh, yeah, with. I just don't. I understand How do you do that? Yeah. Okay. It from that point. Versus so the, an actual that. utility bill that you get. We need to work on HOAs on the other end of just getting them to. Yeah. Okay. Are you good? We will try our best to capture this. And it, I think maybe what we might do is have a, if, if council is um, prepared to give us this kind of instruction, we could regroup with councilors Seymour and Baker one more time to make sure we map through this because there's new information, I think, for Councilor Baker around the lot size part of it. And maybe we could, we could, re we could revisit that and at least establish um, or make sure that we establish a base rate model, which they want us to present back to you. Um, and then we would then model two more uh, on top of that, which would fold in all the things that you all mentioned. Are you saying separately? Separately. Well, it'd be the same. It would yeah. be the same report the same back. Time. So we would come in. So there's no meeting next Monday because it's a holiday. So we, we could come back in on the 28th in post meeting and this, this it's, it's a council night, right? Yes. It's not a study session. So mm -hmm. we come back in and post meeting in a very similar format to tonight with a lot less of that and a lot more looking at three, with your permission, perhaps four, but hopefully no more than three Bless you. scenarios that we bring back for you. And we'll try our very, very best to map what we've heard tonight into those three scenarios, making sure that one of those, these two counselors mm -hmm. are comfortable with. As long as Mr. Lindsay can stand up and tell us what we've lost with each scenario in terms of other capital improvements that we're not going to be investing in if we are having to subsidize with our general fund. So when we so if in a proposal where we bring in other funds, we would specifically line list then where we would be drawing those. What have we lost? Yeah. Okay. So just to be clear, to explicitly assert what the scenarios are. We're talking about the 100 million, 200 million, the base where you'll, you'll confirm with them on that, the baseline. What's the fourth scenario? Two. Well, What's the, the fourth? The extent of capital projects, the 200 million. Uh, like I'm just trying to get us to get look at what is the, the big number and then 100 million and then their potential. Yeah. So you mentioned the fourth. Did you, did you have an idea what that was? No, I think just once once we regroup with the staff team and go back through everything we heard to make sure that the, the options were just in case it's not four. Because we might get to a point, you know, tomorrow <laughs> afternoon where we say, oh my gosh, you know, we, we really got to show them this option because it does the following or it's a cool solution or we alter uh, tier two by a dollar and the whole thing falls into place magically. And, and that's mm -hmm. something you might want to see. Hell, if you come up with a solution we all like, bring us five. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great idea. <laughs> 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 Make it happen. Make it 10. Okay. Awesome. The second piece is simple 
Rehabilitation and Associated Sites Evaluation Direction. Absolutely. What was the question? We have to give him direction for simple rehabilitation. Do what she said. The second memo on tonight. And 1.1 million dollars. Evaluation direction. Right. It was up to spend up to, for the for the public to spend up to one as a reminder up to 1.1 million dollars of an existing contract on analyzing three or four alternatives um, in and around Semper. Yeah, I could read if it would be helpful because the, the the lateness of the hour and that we're in this room. Um, and let me just get straight to the. May I? I Thank I you. Okay. Julie's got it. So we went to some global challenge questions. What is the least cost to address the greatest number of challenges at Semper? What can be done for a mid-cost replacement water facility on Semper and or in and around Semper? Both of these include what are the risks associated? And Sarah, that gets, or Councilor Namella, that gets to some of your questions about what's the trade-off and what would it really take? Finally, what does the comparison between questions one and two and the formerly anticipated facility on Westminster Boulevard site look like? How do they compare and contrast? What are the costs, benefits, and risks? So with these global challenge questions, we have a scope of work where, because we're engineers, we divide it up a lot and we've got tasks and stuff. But these global challenge questions will give us space to noodle through some of the, what about that site? What about that one? What if we do the thing? And in this way, we get city manager's office involved and they help us frame it with our consultants and staff so that we work to addressing not just the nitty gritty, but kind of these broader themes to take a good hard look at both, both places where we might find value in investing in water treatment. Question, so is this, uh, was it 1.1 million? Of the cost the consultant up to 1.1 million yes that's the room that i have a city manager on the contingency for the existing uh, contract with this <clears throat> this firm so we would um not clearly not spend more than that um and i think we ranged it in at 750 to nine hundred thousand dollars it's based on the three challenge questions that julie just described and we've spent millions in the past years on this contract Research. is $21 million total. This particular one is about 12 million. Oh, sorry. And then the water, the raw water line and the finished water line. All in all, we had about 30 million in debt from 2019. It's committed, not entirely spent because the remaining portion of the land acquisition is still in, still in the bank, so to speak. And the unspent funds from the paused work are not yet spent. I just want to state that I I hope <clears throat> the results of this, because one million dollars is not little to me, um, but I hope the results of this, what I'm hoping for, let me restate this. What I'm hoping for is that we are not just searching for an answer we like. We need to make sure that, I mean, we, we can't keep spending money on consultants to give us answers if, and we may or may not like the answers so we get, spend more money on consultants. What I hope to get out of this is that we actually get to a decision. I want to get to, to get to a decision and I don't want to spend more of the city's, the taxpayer money on more consultant money, on more, just, we just keep adding consult, con, con, consultancy spend and it's not, fiscally responsible at, at, at this point. Whatever they come up with, for example, if they say, oh, the city's been right the whole time, we have to just suck it up and listen and just do what we, what, what we need to do. That's what I'm hoping for out of this, that whatever they say, we trust it and we stop spending millions of dollars on this. I'm, I want to understand your premise of your question because it feels you'll have to excuse me, but it feels accusatory that some of us are just in this because we want an answer we want. Like if you're comfortable with what they're 
uh, going with. Say you're comfortable with what they're going with, and then the majority of the council can decide what it wants to decide. But it's not just suck it up and move forward. Nobody's here throwing some sort of fit like a child. I've been sitting through these meetings, done lots of homework. Prior to being on council, done lots of homework. I understand the challenges around it. And just because it's not because I didn't hear what I wanted to hear, because it's not affordable for the residents. Period. And I sent up uh, a memo that had uh, four alternatives in it, but there were some primary questions we needed to answer first before we could even proceed to address those questions. We can't answer those. Like, is the module shown in the Westminster Boulevard, is that a complete unit? And I, that's sort of a yes or no question. And if we're 30% into the design, shouldn't we know if that's a, a freestanding, you put raw water in here, you get finished water out here? Or am I completely off base on that? And I didn't think that would involve scads of money or anything else like that. And if we can't, if we, okay, I'll, let me give you the hard tangibles. If we can, if we can no longer use the grandfather clause to send effluent water out of the water treatment plan, we just have to accept that, that we've lost that grandfather clause. So then we're going to have to find another way to dispose of the effluent water out of the module. Can we run a pipeline under the railroad tracks? Lindsay warned me about the challenges of that up to 92nd. And can our big dry creek handle that effluent? And if big dry creek can't, can we then run a pipeline in the right of way of the Niver Creek and then make water dual purpose water features in that undeveloped Westcliff Park? And if we can't do those things, if we can't answer those questions, then, then we're going to be sort of stuck with the Westminster Boulevard project. And I thought, I really thought these were easier questions to answer. Could that be covered under the study? Like well, it, kind I mean, of an analysis of an alternative? It is. I, I would just, I, I would not be able to represent um, counselors that I could answer system design questions for a water treatment facility, even if they are phrased very, very clearly and succinctly as, as you phrased them, Councilor Baker. Um, there are so many, it's an ecosystem uh, treatment uh, treatment regime and, and I would never pretend to be able to comment on those. And I don't think that our, that our staff engineers would either. That's why this proposal is before you tonight because we've been listening um, to your questions and we've been trying to devise a way to get you um, the answers to your questions in the context of, of a solution approach, right? So do we have solutions for you to your questions? And I, and I just can't, I don't think that our engineers will ever be able to say we can take part A of a plant and move it to location B and have everything um, work out. You, you know, they didn't do the design to get us to the 30% mark. The outside firm did, did that. And, and we would have a firm that knows center inside out be able to answer those those kinds of questions. We'd also have to explore with the rail company what what in that scenario, what it looks like to go under their tracks um, or a different scenario to get to a different different lot. I also wouldn't ever want to rule out solutions that are right in front of us that aren't one of those. And, and that might be um, something in place because we now we now do something different with Semper over the next 15 years to to allow room for us to change something while keeping this part going. So those are the things that are all interrelated. But I just have way up way over my ski tips on being able to answer, you know, in a form like this whether that would work or not. But this firm will answer those challenge questions for us. And the, you know, if I could just maybe recap in in the context of this discussion. So the first challenge question is, what is the least cost to address the greatest number of deficiencies at Semper? And then what are the risks associated? The second challenge question is, what can be done for a mid-cost replacement water treatment facility on the Semper site and including parcels in and around the Semper site? What are the risks associated with that? So that's, I think, those questions. 
And then what does the comparison between those two challenge questions answer? So rehabilitate SEMPER in place, look at SEMPER plus model, um, and then compare it to water 2025, which is um, almost at the 30% design level. Um, so really bringing our knowledge of the SEMPER options up to match our knowledge of the water 2025 options and bringing that back to you, then you have all the information that you would need. I, I think you could be very much in a position to make a decision at this branch where we have the equivalent level of information on provided to you on that. And it matches up with the financial model because we can model each of those three challenge question mm -hmm. answers for you as well when we bring it back to you. When will we have that? Um, this is this is four months, um, four months to get to the, to the end stage of these answers. We could give you progress reports moving forward. And based on the work tonight on the first part of this meeting, um, you could certainly make adjustments to the rates if you so chose, and this would be on a parallel path. You can, by the way, revisit the rates at any time you want as a city council. I think it's gonna be really, really valuable, especially for those councilors who have been asking for the question of, you know, is there another way to be answered? And I think, yeah, I mean, that's, let's is there another way? Which, that is, will help. which is, I, you know, I see that that's a great conversation to have. And, but, but that, that's a, a packet that's over here. Um, our residents want rate relief now. And so that's something that we're going to have. We're going to have to have that discussion. And and I, I I'm glad we're having the conversation, and I'm glad we're continuing that conversation, and appreciate that. But at some point, it's going to come to a vote. So. And it's they're they're close to overlapping. So. Well, no, yeah. I mean, that's that's how we pay for our CIP. But right now, it's like let's. We're going to have to pull the trigger. Or we're gonna. I, I'm gonna ask to pull the trigger, and then we'll put it to council, and we'll have that discussion, and then we'll vote. I know when they were looking, um, they looked at one piece of open space, but I never heard of others that are lower, um, don't have to cross 36. Um, don't know why they weren't looked at, because we can, if we had to use something like that now's the time to know where we need to or how much we need to buy in order to and especially since we just got um, the open space thing just passed um, if we need to buy equivalent to match that now's the time to do that and you just didn't hear anything out i was a, just a plain citizen trying to find stuff um, and you just didn't see anything it was just boom, here's where it's going to go. And no comparisons, no anything. So Well, the residents near, near Overland Trail came out in mass. I heard I yeah. heard about that. In mass. But, um, Special but look at the, look at Waverly Acres where this one's proposed to go and they were able to go in and talk to them. So, you yeah. know, it doesn't make sense. So anyway, uh -huh. I just... Uh, to me, if we had really studied, studied and gotten concrete things along the way, that would be in front of us. It is obvious we don't have that. And that's what we're missing. Go on. You've got four people that haven't been through the process. And we have only one option. We heard there were 57 sites. We came down to two. This is the one changed. And nothing in between to tell me how much it was going to be here. Nothing. And, and that's so we aren't able to compare and we're being beat up in the public by it. We're being crucified and we're just asking the common questions as if you're buying a home. You do those comparisons and, and you look at things and, and what makes sense? What can you afford? And we know based on the proposal for the one that's going to go in at Westminster Boulevard, we can't afford that either right now. And with the prices that we have, um, people are gonna be asked to pay some hefty prices. I had my bond people that I used to work for run the numbers. I know what it will cost per household. That's 
not including your regular water rates. To the mayor's point, would it be possible in the study to outline the parameters for what we need in a site? I don't know if that's possible, but like, mm -hmm. you know, there were 57 sites. Clearly, some parameters were set and we came down to less. So just to be clear so the community also understand. To the extent that you can. Well, I think what we could also do, and I'll Julie chime in, we, we have a lot of that information on that project website. So I'll send that out to city manager's office because that walks through more of the process and we can maybe put some more information to that. But that might speak to more of what you're asking for as well. Direction, okay. I think so. It is midnight. And if you need to help, just, just call us and Rich and I will. I think maybe we, if you were up for, we do a follow up session together and we can. I'd love to get it. I really want to commit to getting an option.